The governor of Oklahoma has officially signed into law a bill banning the performing of abortions except in any circumstance to save the mother's life. And I mean, this is the boldest move we've seen in the pro-choice, pro-life political arena in the past year. There's been a lot of states that have been enacting restrictions on after how many weeks can you get an abortion? Oklahoma just went for it. And it is widely speculated that in the next two months, we could see the Supreme Court overturn Roe v. Wade. It's looking more and more like that may be the case. Even many left-wing activists agree. They think this is very, it's going to be apocalyptic. So, apocalyptic. so we'll get into all of that stuff. Plus, we've got a bunch of stories about these parental rights and education, uh, parental rights and education bills. We saw this in Florida. Many other states are seeking to uh, enact bills that are similar. But now we're seeing that Maryland and New Jersey are kind of going the opposite direction. Maryland actually has a mandate that's going to require gender ideology being taught with some, uh, let's just say explicit, I'll put it this way. If I were to tell you what they were, what they were teaching these kids, YouTube would probably demonetize this stream. So we'll, 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 don't worry, we'll explain it, but I think you get the idea through innuendo. Plus, we got, we got a bunch of stuff to talk about in terms of crime. New York, obviously, there was a very serious tragic incident. We'll talk about that. And Oberlin College lost a major lawsuit after accusing a small bakery of being racist, and they're refusing to pay those uh, those fees, those uh, the, the settlement. So we'll get into all of that. Joining us today is a huge group of people, but uh, we'll go through all of them. We got Matt Walsh. Thanks for hanging out, man. Yeah, great to be here. Excited sure. about it. You want to introduce yourself? Uh, well, you said to be quick, so I thought that was it. You know, um, no, you can you get a little bit more than that. Well, I, I'm excited to be here. I'm and uh, honored to be. You know, LGBT author and now a women's studies scholar as well is what I'm adding to my to my resume. So great to be here. Right on. We got Elijah Schaefer. Yeah, uh, I'm the host of Slightly Offensive podcast on YouTube. You can check it out. Co-host of You Are Here. And I got to say, man, it looks like uh, the YouTube money is good because that uh, Star Trek portal that beamed me in here from uh, mm -hmm. Dallas. I haven't seen one of those. It's your newest oh, toy. Yeah. Very yeah. nice. It's, it's a satellite and it beams you and then bounces you off the satellite to Nashville. Yeah, and it was really fun and I only lost a finger. But it's not you, but it's not you. The original you is dead and this is a copy with all your memories. Hey, the key thing is I've been dead you. inside for 28 years, oh, so yeah. we're doing all right. <laughs> we got Libby. Hey, everybody. Libby Emmons, editor-in-chief of the Post Millennial. Glad to be here in right Nashville. On. And eventually, I will figure out where everyone is. These new cameras are really throwing oh, me through a loop. The wrong yeah, one. I was like, well, <laughs> we're going to get this time. It's exciting. Hilarious. But I'm also here. I'm pushing buttons unsuccessfully. I, in the I thought you were just going to skip Seamus. Yeah, yeah I was just I was like, oh, I'll try this hurt. one. I know. It's another white guy with a beard. <laughs> yeah, I, know. I, I know. Another one of them. Uh, I'm Seamus Coglin. There he is. There you I, go. Am I here yeah, now? Yeah, am, I, am I on screen? Is it my time to shine? I'm Seamus Coglin. I am the creator of Freedom Tunes. We do animated political cartoons. We just released one today on Joe Biden. I think you guys will love it. We're releasing one on Thursday about groomer teachers so go over there subscribe check it and, out and we're going to be talking about groomer teachers but before we do my friends head over to eatrightandfeelwell.com to pick up your biotrust keto elevate c8 mct oil powder normally i have the bag to hold up but we're here in nashville i don't have the bag yeah. uh i've been doing keto for some time and you may have noticed that i kind of lost a bit of weight since uh, the end of last year because i've been cutting out the sugar i've been putting the keto uh, keto elevate stuff in my, in my coffee and i think it's done me wonders so again, go to eatrightandfeelwell.com. You'll get 51% off. You'll also get a 60-day money-back guarantee. Keto Elevate provides your body only C8, the most ketogenic MCT. That means it provides support for energy levels, healthy appetite management, mental clarity and focus, athletic performance. Seriously, I've been, I've been feeling great. Five grams of the highly sought-after MCT8 per scoop. Keto Elevate, personally, it's my favorite MCT. You get free shipping on every order. And for every order today, BioTrust donates a nutritious meal to a hungry child in your honor through their partnership with NoKidHungry.org. To date, BioTrust has provided over 5 million meals to hungry kids. Please help BioTrust hit their goal of 6 million meals this year. You will also get free VIP live health and fitness coaching from BioTrust's team of expert nutrition and health coaches for life with every order and their free e-report, the top 14 ketogenic foods with every order over at eatrightandfeelwell.com. Biotrust, we love you. Thank you for sponsoring the show. And don't forget, head over to timcast.com. Become a member. We're going to have that extra spicy members only show coming up around 11 p.m. Eastern for everybody. So sign up, become a member if you want to watch that. As a member, you're helping keep our journalists gainfully employed. They all love you so much, and we all do. And don't forget to smash that like button, subscribe to this channel, share the URL to this video wherever you can right now. If you're on YouTube watching live, just click it, post it wherever you can. We, uh, uh, we are eternally grateful for your grassroots marketing support. Let's jump into this first story from TimCast.com. Oklahoma 
Oklahoma governor signs bill making performing an abortion a felony. The law grants an exception for abortions performed to save the life of the mother. Governor Kevin Stitt signed Senate Bill 612 on April 12th. The measure makes it a felony to perform an abortion except to save the life of a mother. Anyone who performs an abortion could face up to 10 years in prison and a $100,000 fine. The law goes into effect in 90 days. Quote, we want to outlaw abortion in the state of Oklahoma, Stitt said during a signing ceremony. I promised Oklahomans that I would sign every pro-life bill that hits my mm. desk. And that's what we're doing here today. Women who seek or receive an abortion are not subject to criminal charges under the bill. Now, my question is, Roe v. Wade still exists, right? So what's going on? Well, I mean, first of all, I'm never satisfied. So the, <laughs> the bit there about except to save the life of, of the mother, I'm, I'm a little I want to read more into that because I, I don't think that exception should, should be there because you, you, usually when you look into that, you find that, well, saving the life of the mother, what they're really talking about is. Uh, if the mother is in emotional distress, then she can still get the abortion. So you have to look into that because in, in reality, that, yeah. in, in reality, there, there is never a need for an abortion to save a mother's life. It never actually happens. But putting that aside, um, I think what we see here is the Republican Party. And this is like a shock for those of us who grew up. We're so used to Republicans being milquetoast and and uh, cowardly. And many of them still are. But we're starting to see in some of these states, Oklahoma, Florida, like the Republicans are actually going on offense, which is exactly what mm -hmm. you have to do. Is, is go on offense and try to try to enact laws according to your own value system rather than always playing defense. Mm -hmm. And if you believe that abortion is the murder of a child, then of course you're going to do everything within your power to outlaw. You're not going to sit around and say, well, the Supreme Court has spoken. It's the murder of a child. I think, I think, there's, some uh, I think uh, there's a semantic issue here as well. So you said there's, there's, never, a, uh, you said there's never a circumstance to have a, perform an abortion to save the life of the mother? Yeah. Is, is it, so do you want to just elaborate on that? Well, usually you hear about this uh, abortion to save the life of the mother thing and these, these especially late term abortions. And um, so what I guess you got to use an example. So like one example would be, um, let's say the mother is, is pregnant and then has some sort of medical complication, um, cancer or something like that. And, and you, you have to end the pregnancy, especially later in, in um, later term. Well, yeah, you, you end the pregnancy to save the mother's life. You don't have to kill the child first, though. I mean, you, you can deliver the child at least try so you could yeah you can at least attempt it so we we i i could submit and agree that there are times when to save the mother's life you have to end the pregnancy especially in later terms um but you don't have to killing the child is an extra step that is not necessary you can deliver the child and in many of these life saving quote unquote life saving abortions you have children that could be delivered and you send them up to the NICU and there's a, there's a good chance that the child could still survive. Yeah, yeah there's, see, there's children that survive at like 21 weeks at this point. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so viability continues to get lower and lower. So so, yeah. so just just to clarify, because um, I, I mentioned a semantic issue, is uh, uh, what you're saying is they should at least try to save the life of the child. If yeah, because good. abortion, here's what abortion is. Abortion is the direct intentional killing of the child. Mm -hmm. There is never a time when you need to commit the direct intentional killing of the child to save the mother. So if well, there's if, if late term abortion doesn't make any sense, you know, third mm -hmm. trimester abortion is completely nonsensical because the child can survive. Right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Because in the late term abortion, you're still delivering the child. There's still a delivery that happens, but right. you kill the child first. Yeah. Why do you need to kill the child? So just, so just deliver the child. Just to further clarify in, in, in the instance where there is a severe abnormality and the baby likely will not survive and the mother likely will not survive a birth. You're saying that if they were to deliver the baby or maybe a C-section, they can at least try to save both. Is that what you're saying? Absolutely. There's, there's, no, there's no reason why you wouldn't try to do that unless you're just saying that, well, the, the child's life doesn't count. He has no moral worth, which is what our laws say right now in most states is that the child's life, he has no moral worth. We don't have to try to save him. That's an interesting and, uh, point. Yeah, and I want to mention this because I basically said something along those lines on the last episode where we did discuss this. Yeah. There are procedures that will be referred to as abortions in order to make the argument that abortion is ever medically necessitated, and it's just not true. So if there is an operation that is required to save the life of the mother, but that poses a risk to the life of the unborn child, that is not the same thing right. as an abortion. Uh, and there's a principle known as the principle of double effect where 
you're trying to do one thing and there might be a negative unintended consequence, but it's not the same thing morally as intending to do the secondary thing, which can result. Yeah, that's what I was getting to is that that's a good point, because the cancer example is one where maybe the mother is diagnosed with late stage cancer and you have to, you know, chemo or something. And and there's a chance that that will kill the child. Well, if you're not directly and intentionally killing a child, you're just you're doing a, a, a procedure to try to save the mother's right. life. And tragically, I the see. child dies in the process. Yeah. That is not an abortion. Well, that's the same yeah. thing, too, when it comes to, to the medical procedure, because we're talking about euthanasia, specifically ending uh, you know, uh, long-term care or making people comfortable as they die. I mean, there's a big difference of intentionally you know, injecting a lethal dose of an opiate to end somebody's life or some sort of a solution that would kill them versus if somebody's already on you know, hospice and they already are, their organs are running at 20, 30, 40 percent capacity, and then you give them some sort of an opiate and their heart just simply cannot process cannot take it their liver cannot process the drug so then they go into organ failure and die are you then going to say that the hospice nurse you know murdered the woman did she go in to kill her is that is did she euthanize her no you'd go well she did what she could to make her comfortable and that then she died and responded differently and so what we always do is we put a lot of things in umbrellas it's like the lgbtq community how they keep adding letters to, mm -hmm. de to decide what's involved in our group abortion has an expansive definition where sometimes you've even heard of stillbirths counted as abortion if they force yes. you know if they force the 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 delivery and it's a stillbirth they go oh well it was an abortion because the baby was dead and you go that's not an abortion that baby was dead so they forced the delivery but it allows them to it allows them to umbrella to justify the means and that's a constant issue that i see and i want to make one little point here like you were saying earlier the problem with the the idea of necessity uh, in abortion for for women to save their lives i mean if you look at what's happening in canada right now with with the euthanizing uh, argument they want to be able to euthanize people who suffer with depression with schizophrenia with anxiety they're this pushing is something for this they already do in northern europe and okay. it's really devastating yeah, see, and they there actually you go. they actually put a young woman to death Mm. See, and so, um, so you were depressed like a few years ago and it's really yeah she wanted to be euthanized um, so you can kill your baby i'm depressed i don't want to have a baby so where do you where do you draw the line of what's what's uh putting the mother's there, life in jeopardy i think matt you got some nuance that is often uh, left out of the conversation too because you know my, my, my line of questioning was certainly there's going to be some circumstance where the mother and the baby's life are both in jeopardy but the term abortion i think is often just meant to imply taking the baby out Afterwards, right. it's sort of uh, uh, there's no there's no real thought to it. So when you explain that, well, now I understand if there's a circumstance and correct me if I'm wrong, in which the mother and the baby might both likely die. Well, if they have to remove the baby, they can try and save it. Mm -hmm. Right. And in our in our this is it's really a miracle the way that our technology has progressed that now you can deliver a baby at 21 weeks and, and right. oftentimes the child will still survive. And this is we're, we're going to get to a point where eventually we get to the point with the technology where a child can survive outside of the womb at, at any stage if, if, well, we if, already if need have be. A, we have a federal rule, right? We have the 14 day rule for research um, where you can, where scientists, researchers can uh, basically take, um, you know, a fertilized embryo and grow it in a lab and you can grow it up to 14, uh, not 14 weeks, uh, 14 days. You can grow it up to 14 days and then you can't grow it in the lab anymore. Um, because then you're experimenting on wow. humans, mm. essentially. Isn't it interesting, Isn't it interesting how they've decided so, you're human at 14 well, weeks, but before no, that you're four, not experimenting? Days. Or 14 days. days. I'm sorry, sorry. Days. But before that you're it's not experimenting day on human So you're not yeah. allowed to experiment after 14 days. Um, so so well, it counts as life in a Petri dish at yes. 14 days. At yeah. 14 not, days, that's But in the correct. womb, it would not count. That's well, so right. That's by right. the law. What I'm really interested in... I'm sorry, I just got to ask. Let's say we're at 18 weeks pregnancy. And there's a medical complication where they're like, if we don't, you know, end this pregnancy, the baby and the mother will die within a week or two. I mean, I, I know it's an edge case, but I'm sure there are circumstances. What would your perspective be on something like that? Well, this is where you get into it. And it is important to, to emphasize it is it's like a friend. We're, right. we're talking about a small percentage of cases and, and the vast majority of abortions have nothing to do with saving mother's exactly. life. But in these kinds of like incredibly devastating situations, then you have to fall back on these kind of philosophical distinctions like double effect. Um, and in a situation like that, then maybe, you know, you might perform a, a life-saving procedure on the mother that's like almost certain to result in the death of the child, but that's not your intention. That's not what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. I see it, right, right. So yeah. it's, it, it, that, and that's the distinction. It's, and sometimes you get to the real fringe cases, it, it does feel like you're splitting hairs, but you're actually not because the principle is really important. And I, well, there I, are I think, cases where women eschew radiation treatment for cancer because they're pregnant and they don't want to and that's and that's heroic child. but it's like that's heroic but we would also i'm not going to sit here and say that 
if a mother needs radiation that 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 I think she should be morally required to hmm. forego it. That that's a heroic thing, and I, I have a lot of respect for it. I think that you could still, by principle of double effect, get the cancer treated. Agreed. Right. Yeah. So did you well, elaborate on double I, effect already? Just, yeah. So, so the idea behind the principle of double effect is if you are attempting to do something which is good, but there is an outcome that is bad, which can result from it, but that bad outcome is not your intention. You're not morally culpable for it in the way that you would be if you were just going out of your way to ensure that outcome. But so, just to clarify not as much as you would be. There's a lot of good intentions. Well, I that think I, really well, what I'm saying, not things. as much as you would be, I, I want to be really clear here because I, I would have to, I would have to reread up on this principle again. I, I think it's actually the case where you're not culpable. Yeah, this is well, who, who, this yeah. is the old uh, tram car. Yes. Uh, Hypothetically, yeah, yeah. you guys know that. But, it's, right, of course. We, we, we got to clarify this because, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think there are some really dumb communists. Certainly there are really bad ones, but who are thinking, you know, if I take the farm from the farmer and give it to the farmhands, I'll be doing great. And then oh. everyone starves to death. It's like they're responsible. But for that's, but here's that's the difference. Justify the means. Exactly. That's different. Totally different. You, yeah. you mean is well, I mean, they're they're directly doing something which is intrinsically immoral, which is stealing somebody yeah, so else's let's, property. So let's get into the, the tram. I see. I see. I see what you're saying. The, I, the tram thing. It's it's if I remember correctly, it's like a thought experiment where there's a train coming down the track and there's like five people tied to the track and you're standing next to the switch and you could pull the switch and send the train on a different track. But there's one guy on that track. Uh, is it OK to pull the the the, uh, the lever and send it off to save the five people? And the answer is. Yes, because your your intention is to save the five. You're not trying to kill the one guy. Um, on the I, other I, hand, I though, I disagree with that. Yeah, analogy. I disagree. Really? Well. Yeah, no, no, because that's if, if you're like, I know my action will kill somebody, but I'm going to do it because I think one that's utilitarianism. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I don't think, I think so. I think, I think that's a, the argument. I mean, right, it's I think a utilitarian a, argument. I think no. a better argument is just literally what we're talking about with a medical procedure. A doctor says this patient has a a tumor next to an artery. If I don't remove it, they'll die in a year. But there's a risk they die in the in the process. And they say, I'm going to I'm going to intervene. If the person dies, we're not going to be like, you murderer. We're going to be like, yeah, in the, you're in, trying in to the save train somebody. car situation. If somebody pulls that lever to save the five, not at all intending to kill the one guy. Are, are we going to send that guy to jail for murder? I mean, I think clearly we would not. That's a good point, too. But and man, and, is that scary. And so the, the difference is like, <laughs> I would okay, want to be that one guy, man. Yeah. But the thing is, what, what if there was no lever to pull? And instead of pulling a lever, you just threw another person in front of the train to stop it from hitting the other five. Now oh, that would geez. be that would be murder, yes. right? So that's that's the principle. Ever, double, would you agree that's the principle yeah, double I, effect? I, I, if, yes, I, I would. I would say so. Again, not not an expert on this, but I've also heard the thought experiment put that way. What if there's just a very rotund individual who you can push in front yeah, of the trolley and they'll stop it? I think that's a different question. I think that's a different question. Yeah, it's a very large <laughs> fellow. As far as I'm aware, I, I think that's a different situation, yeah. I, 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 I don't think it's a perfect analogy, but I do get what you're saying. I think the issue with the trolley problem is that there's a guaranteed outcome of five people dying mm. or one move, which is a binary, which is you know uh, five people dying or the binary, you taking action, which kills that one person. Most people, when polled, say they would not pull the switch mm. because you are choosing to kill someone to save five people. I don't, I don't, I don't know if I agree with that analogy, um, simply because I think, you know, it's an issue of like an officer, a cop. He, he, you know, he sees someone draw a weapon and start pointing it at children. So he pulls his gun out and says, drop it and fires. The bullet goes through the guy's shoulder and then hits someone behind him, severely injuring him. We're not going to, you know, we're, we're going to say in defense of others. This is actually a, an affirmative defense in court cases like what happened with Kyle Rittenhouse, that you're not responsible for what's behind the person when you're acting in defense of yourself or others. So I, I think it was specific, uh, specific circumstance. But in the instance where Kyle was attacked, they were saying it was reckless endangerment because Richie McGinnis was close to him and the bullet could have gone through and hurt him. But ultimately, the court decided, no, he can't be responsible. Someone was threatening his life and he took action to protect himself. I, th I think that's kind of a better way to look at it, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, not to get too into the weeds with the trolley problem, but I think there's a very good argument to be made that when you pull that lever, your intention is not to kill any individual person. It's to divert the train right. from hitting those five no, people. I, 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 and it would be morally different if you actually had a vendetta against that one person laying on the track and your intention was to kill them because that would tell us, A, about your future behavior, B, what your decision-making process is, whether you're right, dangerous, right. and C, what but, whether you are actually intending to kill someone. But I disagree because you know the outcome is guaranteed death 
What we're talking about is an outcome where there's a possibility of it, and it's you're you're trying to avoid that. But, but there's, there's guaranteed, also, the there's guy, guaranteed the guy could... death in the in the in the trolley problem anyway. Mm -hmm. What I think is most interesting about the trolley problem is that uh, the contemplation of it it's, itself is like the fallacy that we have control over everything around us. Mm. You know, that we think that just because there's a problem, that means that we have the capability of solving it in some thorough and appropriate way. And we don't. I mean, you know, don't pull the lever. Don't kill anybody. Sometimes bad things happen. Let me, well, I think, let me, can I just, oh, I thought But Matt can I just say, say one thing about the Oklahoma yeah. thing, which is um, Governor Stitt doesn't have control over a large part of his state, mm. right? Right. Native American reservations have their own uh, rules, and they have their own rules according to the federal government. So... Any Native American reservation could open a casino abortion clinic and have that combination. They could do the combo. They could One do whatever they want. Nice combo. And there would be absolutely no ability for the governor to stop that. Let me pull up this story we have. This is uh, Daily Mail says sickening YouTube star couple is slammed for comparing abortion to the Holocaust and branding it the world's most deadly killer in pro love documentary shared with 13 million followers. Cole and Savannah LeBron have come under fire for contrasting the amount of people who got abortions to the amount who were killed during the Holocaust. You know, the first thing I'm going to mention is frame check. Yeah. Do do pro-life conservatives find this sickening and are they slamming them? Or is this the instance of pro-life personalities, large followings, expressing their views and the left mm -hmm. opposing them, calling mm -hmm. this? I think the Daily Mail very obviously framed this in a way that makes it appear like everybody's mad about this. But you know, you guys who are more conservative pro-life, I'm curious what you think there's about this couple. A, yeah, there's only one reason to be pro-life, and that is that you believe that, uh, well, two, the, 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 two, the two basic assertions of a pro-life person is that the child in the womb is a human being, and that it's never okay to intentionally and directly murder an innocent human being. And so if you believe both of those things, then you, you must agree that this Holocaust comparison is valid, because those are, we get 60 million abortions in, in uh, the United States with Ro Roe v. Wade, are those human beings or not? If they're human beings, then that's 60 million humans, that's 60 million people who are killed. And we, we've never seen the systematic slaughter of 60 million human people before mm -hmm. anywhere uh, on Earth. So Can this we, is a the, the, the 60 million number, is this like, what, what, are, the what are the stats behind this? Like, well, I, what's, I, what's interesting about the, what's interesting about in the U.S., abortion in the U.S., is the largest um, single group of women who have abortions are black women. I think it's like 36% of abortions are for um, are done by black mothers, and uh, and that doesn't count California, I believe. And California has the most abortions in the country, and it doesn't count California because California doesn't keep data on the race of women who whose children are aborted. So what are, what, I mean, it does seem to me that there is a genocide against black babies in this country. Well, my, my question is on the statistics about 60 million. I, mm. think, I think it's important because the data I saw says that the overwhelming majority of abortions are listed as no reason given. Mm. So I'm wondering, you know, of the 60 million abortions, if we're going to say it is slaughter, are, are some of these, you know, how would you define them? Is, it, is, mm -hmm. is this entire 60 million just, you know, abortion as contraception? Are there, you know, medical crises or interventions? No, yeah. the, the vast majority of cases. That, that's the, like we were talking about, the medical, we don't have to get into it again, but there's never an actually a reason to, to abort a child for, for, uh, for medical reasons. But this is, like, we could even put all that aside because that's like 1% of the cases. 99% of cases are essentially abortion for contraception. It's just you, you, you don't want the child because you don't feel like having a kid or because you don't think you can afford the child. So that is... Uh, I, I, I really, I, you well, know, real, real quick... Because I have I have a philosophical, ethical, libertarian uh, uh, question about this that I think I'd love to hear your thoughts, Matt. And it's that, uh, you know, personally, I, I have an issue with government intervention in terms of a person being required to provide their body to another person. And so the, the conundrum arises with two individuals sharing one body and then the state determining that one person must provide that body to another person. Typically, the response I get is, and, and I accept is... Um, well, if a woman chooses to engage in you know, reproductive acts and then she brings into her harbor's life, she has accepted a responsibility in that regard. Mm. But then the question of rape arises. If a woman is forced to harbor another person, then the government intervenes and says, we're going to enforce that you will provide your blood and your body to another person. That kind of freaks me out. Well, let me, I'll respond in general terms, even because what, what you're talking about, if that principle is true, that you shouldn't be you know, forced to provide your body to another person. And that would apply not just to, uh, babies conceived through rape, but to all babies that are conceived. 
right? So right. Here, here, here's the response to that. That's a challenge. Um, first of all, it turns out we as human beings are not these autonomous, uh, free individuals who have no responsibilities to anybody else. It's just That's just not the reality. We have responsibilities in society, but especially according to relationships. So that's my problem with when it's framed that way of, uh, well, you shouldn't be prov- forced to provide your body to somebody. Yeah, I shouldn't be forced to provide like an organ to my neighbor, right. but to my child, like the relationship there carries with it certain responsibilities. So what I would say is should let's let, let's let's take it outside of the womb. Should parents be forced, quote unquote, to care for their babies or at least to find someone else who will like should it be legal for a mother to say of her six month old baby, I don't really want this baby anymore and to just like throw it in a, the child in a dumpster or drown the child in a, in, a, in a bath or even just leave the child at home and just go somewhere and leave. We would say, no, you can't do that because yeah, you, you don't have a responsibility to the six month old across the street, but that's your child. You're there, the parent. There is a difference between something that's directly connected to your bloodstream. And this is why I say I, I understand and accept the argument that if a person chooses to engage in an action, they have a responsibility. But if someone is forced into that position, it, 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 I just find it creepy that you know, a woman can be victimized by someone, then have, I understand the child is innocent in this regard, I absolutely believe that when it comes mm-hmm. to rape, but then for just a person to be told by the state, this, the, the being that harbor, this harbored in your body that is using your blood and nutrients that was put there by force, you must nurture well, and nourish. Here's the thing about that, right? It's not the law necessarily. So we have the laws, we have the state can tell you, you know, tells you what to do or whatever. But the real problem is that we have a lack of a shared value system. And if we had values that encouraged motherhood and that encouraged valuing life, regardless of what the law is, we would have less abortion, you know? And I I think that that's really important. We need to encourage motherhood, encourage parenthood, encourage families. And if we did that, then it doesn't matter what the law said. People wouldn't kill their children. I thought it was great. Actually, I don't know if you guys read Vogue, but I was checking out Vogue. and uh, read it every day. Right? (laughs) And uh, Rihanna is pregnant, and her and ASAP Rocky are having a baby. And I thought it was really cool how she said... This was an unplanned pregnancy. We weren't trying to have kids. And immediately, as soon as she got the pregnancy test back, they were like, and now we're on this journey. And they went for it. They're not married yet. They're engaged and all of that. But I really thought that it was a very powerful statement for this extremely popular pop star to come out and say, I didn't intend to get pregnant, and I'm having my baby, and I'm stoked about it. But what's, I what's, loved that but message. I, I understand that, but you know, rape is a specific. Rape is a specific thing. Yeah, and it's and it's, and it's kind but of. you can't scary. you can't punish you can't punish the child for the sins right. of the father. You, you can't right. if you but, want but if you, you want to execute. But you the can. Mother. But the mother is always punished for the sins of the father. That happens all but the you, time. You, you can't so, punish so the woman. Of, Exec- you know, if you want to execute somebody for rape, constantly. execute the rapist. I'm all about well, that. No, but look, if if so now we're going to execute the father because she's going to be like abducting the single mother of a. Well, if it's a rapist, so 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 if you no rehabilitation. For the guy who if just a person uh, severely injured, if a person severely injures another person, and that, and l- let's say they're rushed into the hospital, and there's two people that are injured, and they say, "This guy's heart's failing. Hook him up," or "This guy's kidney's failing. We're gonna we're gonna connect their bloodstreams." You wake up like, "Hey, I didn't do this to this guy," and they say, "You can't separate because he'll die, and you're responsible." Like, but I have nothing to do with this there, guy. There, there are so many differences between a, a abortion and that that hypothetical. You know, it's like a famous hypothetical. Judith Jarvis Thompson first had that and um so many differences like one is that uh, unplugging yourself from someone in a hospital is different from directly and intentionally killing a baby Mm. like abortion is not just simply unplugged it's not you're just like unplugging you you are killing the baby you are doing something violent so it would be more analogous to oh i don't want to be hooked up to this guy so i'm going to put a pillow over his face and kill him Mm -hmm. and when you start framing it that way all of a sudden it's like it it takes on a different kind of feeling and also again you're you are disregarding the relationship so here's the yeah. real analogy what if your your child is in the hospital because of something you did and um and they need to be hooked up to you for a short period of time in order to survive mm-hmm. well no, no would, we're, would, we're would it be, i know but would it be acceptable to because you don't want to be hooked up to your child to put a pillow over their face and just kill them well, of I think. course not right so so that's we, we you can't ignore the relationship and I, I don't know why it's it's a problem to just say just like we say to parents of born children, no matter how the kid was born. We say, you are responsible for that child. 
you must take care of the, we are requiring you by law to take care of the child or you'll go to jail but, or find well, someone else who will the issue, I think, the issue is the rape well, that, I, that, that's, that's the one thing that changes all of this because I, I, I absolutely say if a person chooses to engage in these behaviors they have accepted that responsibility and they must uh, adhere to that responsibility but if a woman is walking through a park on her you know, way home and uh, it's you know, 5 p.m. and someone grabs her and you know, uh, drags her into a lobby or something or into an alley and then she rushes to the hospital and they do a check. Then a few weeks later, she finds out she's pregnant and says, I never chose this. I resisted. They forced it upon me and I do not want to provide my body to another person. Tim, Would the I, well, state I, I, then I, say, we don't care, yes. you have to. Well, yeah, and I think this is, this is the, where the argument gets stupid in our society. You know, we see this uh, amaze sex education for children and I, and I was reading through some of their PDFs that was talking about rape specifically that I thought was fascinating because it was talking about the need for consent and there was a situation that was so outrageous that would never happen and I noticed something interesting it goes everyone was there at a baseball game at Philip and Jackson's house and um, you know Bethany had drank too much alcohol and I saw, thought wait a second we're about to talk about sex and consent. We're ta now we're starting this with underage drinking. Okay, so there's already the problem here isn't isn't I, what I'm trying to say this. The problem here isn't the consent. The problem would be the underage drinking we should work on because that's clearly what's leading to the behavior. When we talk about the rape though with with children, the key thing is, and this is what I'm saying. When we talk about rape, this is why they try to redefine even what rape is in college, where they say a rape is if you regret it afterwards. A rape no, I, is I, if you. But I'm, but I'm being serious. I'm, I'm genuinely being serious. The problem with the rape argument. Is that you know you're going okay if someone was forcibly I'm not gonna get graphic but there's a violent crime a violent crime that is heinous against someone's bot a woman's body and she's forcibly impregnated well number one that's not the definition legally of rape anymore and specifically socially people just say rape can almost be like gender it's if you just regretted it later in life now, I don't, I'm genuinely I don't, being I don't, serious about right, that right, I don't care about the left's arguments on this well that's, I, it, it, I, does, I, it does I, argue I, I, legally I, I, though I, right, I'm saying so, that so in the forcible my, my situation point is for you not legally for all of you for your morals and principles. I'm just, I have no problem if your answer is the woman must be forced. My, my attitude is that freaks me out. I'm not, I'm not okay with there's that. A, there, there's a, to answer your specific question. So uh, we, we can all agree that if a woman is impregnated through, through violent, like forcible rape, it's a horrible, unthinkable crime that was committed against her, which is why I think, go ahead and I'm all about executing rapists um, if they're found guilty. But you, you still, you have a person. A person was was created mm -hmm. and they exist now. And so the question is, does that person have moral worth? Do they have any human rights at all? Or, or are we going to say that the manner of your conception determines whether you have moral worth and human rights? And I'm freaked out by that. I, I, I don't agree with that. Yeah, I, 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 real, real quick, just to wrap. Uh, I, I, I understand, too, that, you know, in the instance a woman is raped, she will have the kid. She will not die. You know, in this circumstance, you're saying kill someone or a woman has a child for, you know, is, is pregnant for nine I, months. And then I, gives birth. you know, I have right. a I have a lot of issues with this scenario as well, Tim. I'm, I have a very similar perspective to yours um, in the event that you're raped, let's say, by your father and you're 15 years old. Um, are you then forced to have that child? Are you forced to raise that child? Are you forced to like you know, look at that child every day and see you're, that your father raped you when framing, you're 15 yeah. years old. Well, but it, you, but that you, exists, but that but happens, that's the, right? But that this happens. Is the framing. It's, and I are think, you allowed to kill a child ever? Well, I I don't think that's entirely the framing. So I don't the kids think, born I think in there's, illegal activities. I think there's, I think there's, I think there's yeah. more to it than that, right? I do think there's more to it than that. I think a big problem with the abortion conversation is how far it's it's gone to the point where you have people, you know, in arguing that you should be able to abort for um you know illnesses that you should be able to ab abort for deformities that you should be able to abort for uh you know getting the biological sex that you want all of these things like having all of this extra stuff in this conversation saying like all of these various reasons that you could abort your child that you should be able to you know kill your baby up to the point of delivery and all of this this has made this conversation so insane <laughs> that we completely forget um you know where it sort of started which was the idea that it would be safe legal and rare i'm not in favor uh -huh. of abortion it's not something that i would do for myself i don't know what i would do if i was you know a teen who had been like raped you know whatever else it is um well, and i think that there's i think that it it makes sense to discuss a woman's life and what that life is going well, to be like why, after she has been forcibly impregnated 
by, you know, some horrible person. I don't think also the idea that once this woman has been forcibly impregnated, we're going to kill the man who did it so that now she can't even get child support from this guy. Well, like, at, at, he at can't do anything. I mean, like, that's insane, too. But how is it not insane? Minimum, right? I mean, uh, how no, I, I mean, I'm 100% thoroughly opposed to guess, capital punishment can I just in make every single before, circumstance. I just want to make one point before you jump in here. I think it's morally insane to say that if somebody rapes a woman and she becomes pregnant, it's ethically permissible to murder the child, but not to put the rapist to death. Well, right. and it isn't isn't it okay? I'm not aware of any reason to be pro-life other than the two that I gave that um, the the life in the womb is is a human life, and it is never okay to intentionally and directly kill innocent human life. That's my whole reason for being pro-life. I don't ha I can't think of any other reason. And so if that's your reason for being pro-life, then you you can't make exceptions. You can't say, well, unless the baby's conceived through rape. It's more it's yeah, morally I, in, from, incoherent. I think that it makes sense to talk to this woman, this hypothetical raped person that we're talking about. It makes sense to talk to them and to like and you know encourage them to have a child if 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 they have you know the means and whatever else and the mental capability to do that. Um, but I don't think it. I don't think that it should be the federal government making there's, that determination. There's there, there's an interesting point here. Is as, as you know, if we try to create a value system on like moral points what is what is more m morally weighted than i think i understand a bit of the conversation it's that uh, a woman will suffer a physical constraint and large inconvenience and potentially trauma being forced to carry th this child but she'll live and the baby won't so i understand that point it, it there's, a, there's a challenge in for me in the idea of just the extent to which society has power over other people's bodies, but I totally see what you guys are saying 100%. Like, the woman will not die by having a baby and being pregnant for nine months. The baby will die. And if we want to maximize good, the challenge is, does the state then say, you know, you're going to sacrifice for nine months and, you know, have this as a part of you for the rest of your life, but at least two people survive in the long run? It's yeah, I, tough I, questions, man. I think the other thing is um, sometimes what gets mixed into this conversation is like there's there's two questions about the 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 act itself and then kind of the moral guilt of the person who participates in the act. And I certainly believe that your moral guilt participating in the act when ta I'm talking about abortion could be severely mitigated if we're talking about a child who's you know and, and is being taken advantage of by the abortion industry as well. So that that's sort of like a different discussion about about um the woman and her own moral guilt and and the levels and, and the mitigating circumstances Let's, but but there's still just the question of the act itself and what it this 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 uh, life that's being killed is it a life that's the question and are you directly killing it and is it ever okay to directly kill innocent human life that's that's the question one last question on this before we go to the next story if we develop the technology that can take a uh, you know fertilized egg even you know day one and this is a question I always have as if, well. If, if the, the point if, of viability. If the point of vi viability becomes uh, day one, day you know minute one, we can take it and put it into some kind of machine or technology that will allow it to live. Would 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 you uh, would well, you guys accept that? My, my, right, well, well it is it is to a certain extent. It's a very Huxley question, right? So the question becomes then, um, whose responsibility is this child? Are we going to be manufacturing parentless orphans in order wards to wards of the state wards of the state is this what we're doing because the state does an amazing job right now raising orphans huh. right they do really just <laughs> such okay. stellar work um it's gorgeous you know we we've seen the results of this uh I of course it's spectacular uh, sar sarcasm. Sarcasm. just a teeny <laughs> weensy bit right um so we've seen that so my question with with this because this has been something that i've considered as well who raises the children? Who who gets to tell them what to do? Who teaches them sex ed? Who teaches them whether or not to, you know, castrate themselves because they think they should be something else? And are we going to create a class of citizens that are responsible to the state, that the state is responsible for? You know, what is this, like this weird stormtrooper thing we've got going? Well, they can you be know? put up for adoption, maybe. They can but, be but, put but, up for adoption, but who's, who's going to adopt but, but, these just, kids? Just, just real quick, I want to get your, your guys' thought on this. If... You know, a woman uh, in any so let's let's take two for, two forms of this question. One is, if a woman gets pregnant through any circumstance, and then she says, "Oh, I'm going to place the baby into you know proto future development," and then the doctors transplant it, it survives. Would you be okay with that? And the second question is, if a woman was forced through rape, mm -hmm. and they said, 
we're sorry this happened to you, but we can take the baby out and help, and it'll survive and grow in this external process. How would you feel about that? I, I want to mention one thing. In um, When I last checked the statistics in 2019, there were actually twice as many couples on the waiting list to adopt than there were abortions that happened in the country that year. So I do think there would be but, people willing to adopt. But as for this this theological, right. I'm curious what, what your answer is here. I'll, I'll jump on, but it's... I thought you were going to give your answer. Now you're saying... You yeah, no, now, now I want yours. <laughs> you I want to see... Question. Um, no, no, I, I mean, okay. I have an answer, but I just wanted to interject with that before yeah, we got yeah. into it. So the, the scenario is a woman is raped, child is conceived. There is an option, though, to remove the child... And it will grow and, and survive. And, and, and put the child into like an artificial womb. Yeah. I mean, if the other option is is killing the child, then I certainly would prefer the artificial womb scenario. Let's say the other option is just saying no abortion. You can't. You have to have the baby. Should the woman be like, no, you can't make me do this. I never chose this. Should we go with artificial womb or? I think there's a, there's a complicated. Mandate. Well, there's a complicated moral question here for a few reasons. I mean, firstly. Would this be something that was 100 percent effective, or would it pose a effective. risk to the life of the child? 100% and then, if effective. it is, safer. My, even. my answer to my answer to this safer. question would be that <laughs> there are. Um, That's fantastical. This but is, okay. <laughs> yeah, this is this is a technology that it hasn't developed. There's nothing like it that exists, and so my response here is that. There are, you know, gray haired theologians with beards much better and longer than mine who can sort of stroke them all day and come up with much better answers to this question than I ever could. I'm not sure. And that's who I would defer well, to if they, they know, come, if they come along. I, I do think it's kind of an interesting question because obviously we've talked recently even about, you know, IVF. Uh, and this idea, people call, keep talking about renting wombs. Even mm. this, this, that's surrogacy. This, well, yeah. yes, yes, but I mean, more uh, slang has been this uh, room uh, womb rental that has uh, kind of like plagued Twitter, where people are arguing about this, and not just surrogacy, but also like you know talking about when it's just, for instance, from a donor and also from the original person, and, and what are the ethics of this? And obviously, well, surrogacy it, is prostitution, except you get screwed for nine months. <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> well, I was gonna say, I, I mean, I've, I've met some surrogates, and it's been a very interesting conversation, especially when you know meeting one one girl who um, was a surrogate and the the baby had some sort of a defect mm -hmm. and the people who were using the surrogate wanted her to abort her, using. her kid oh. yeah, using. and she didn't want to abort the kid and then when she gave birth the baby was just taken from her and she doesn't know what happened to the child mm -hmm. and wow. I've, I've had this story i've spoken to her about it so it is an interesting thing but you're, this idea of, of transhumanism is two things I don't think it's going to happen like you think where there's just this lab and we're taking these rare rape victims. Because I think we always use this very niche argument of like, could we create a technology where if there's this rare time, even let's say a, a mom is dying from cancer and the dad wants to keep the baby and we could take the baby out and grow the baby in this artificial womb. You know what? In many ways, it sounds amazing in ethical places in an ethical nation. But all, all I see right now is the movement for that technology so that men can get pregnant. And that's what I've seen with this trans, this trans woman thing. They say trans women will give birth. So I don't see us moving towards an ethical development of technology in this world for the basis of trying to do what's right i see us for trying to go outside the design of humanity whether you're a christian the design of god or you're not a christian the biological mechanisms that, that create a stable species i don't think that we are developing things for the right motives so i'd have to say it's not even theological for me i say no let's mm. let's, I, let's, see, let's yeah. i think let me pull up the story real quick the interesting thing to me is i think we're just looking for what the right answer is in every circumstance right I, we're, I, I, we're also, looking also, for the kantian categorical imperative i just Real quick, I, it is an interesting question, but the thing is, developing this technology where uh, hypothetically you could you could put a, a child at the very early stages in into like an artificial womb, I think it's it's good to develop that kind of technology for the the situation we were talking about at the beginning, which is in a in a medical emergency, yeah. um, to to be able to to be able to do that. But then you you realize that there would be these abuses where now yeah. it's kind of just a convenience thing. Let's take the child out and put him in the artificial womb, and, and that's, that's that's a bad thing. And, and I, that, that's the thing about technology is it would turn into that instantly. Yeah, women would yeah. be like, well, why should I ruin my body for this yeah. when we can put it in an artificial? Well, womb? we saw that right, like Kim Kardashian had babies via surrogate. And let's, I think, let's let's well, look. Okay, I just want, I just want to say, point, yeah. even even intuitively, when we look at this potential technology, this hypothetical device, no one would argue that it would be better for a child to develop in an artificial womb rather than within the body of their own mother. So at the very least, there would need to be some kind of justification, the likes of which you laid out these scenarios right. where a I child needs to be delivered I think we have no early. idea yeah, what the was, effect If it was death of... or artificial womb, you'd take artificial I, womb. I don't, I don't know what the effect of, rate of, of creating motherless orphans would be. I think that that is really something that hasn't been explored. Um, yeah. to not know your mother in that sense. We have not seen a human being who doesn't know their mother in that sense, and I think that we would end up with uh, something a little along the lines of a sociopathic crazy person. Let's pull up this next story from Law and Crime. 
ACLU sues Alabama attorney general over devastating new law making what? medical care for transgender youth a felony. It's a lie. I love how they uh, call it care. Yeah, it's well, a lie. I, I, I know, right Right <laughs> off the bat. Uh, we also have this out of Missouri. Missouri proposes legislation to prohibit gender transitions for minors. Um, yeah, this is an important thing here. They call it medical care. And um, I think there's a framing issue here that at the very least suggests this country is totally fractured under uh, by moral framework. Medical care to the left is a 12-year-old biological male says, I don't feel right. So they say, okay, we're going to give you surgeries, which could you know, permanently alter, damage your body or restrict your body in some way. That we, we, we do that for only gender ideology-based circumstances. Right. Well, and abortion. Well, so you know what I, what I mean is on the right, it's very clear this is child abuse. Yeah. On the left, it's affirmation and medical care. The issue I take with this is just um, if, if a 12-year-old boy said, I'm dysmorphic and I need to cut my hand off, we would not say, well, for the sake of the child, we'll remove their hand. Mm -hmm. But we, we are seeing young women get double mastectomies, uh, at, 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 uh, even at the age of 13 in some circumstances. We had, I, I posted a study on Twitter about it. Mm -hmm. So I, I do want to point out that framing. But then just you know, generally open up the conversation to what we're seeing with these, uh, uh, you know, these states that are banning this. And then there are other states that are going the other direction. Yeah, you have to, you have to define your terms. Med medical care, specific, like medical care is a, is, a, is a thing. It's a specific thing. And medical care is, is something that is done to treat um, a, a problem in the body. It's to treat a disease or a malformation or a, a lesion or something like that. And so then the question is, 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 is puberty a disease that has to be treated? That's the, and that, that's essentially what we're hearing from the trans ideology side of this. They say that, well, you know, you, the child didn't consent to puberty and so you have to put a puberty blocker in. Well, puberty is not a, is not a disease. It's a natural process right. in the body. Well, and it's yeah. not just the body. I mean, hormones wash over the brain mm -hmm. and that's how your brain becomes, you know, more fully developed. Mm -hmm. That's part of it as well. That's part of puberty is becoming an adult. It's not just a bodily thing. It's also, yeah, I mean, it's the, the body of the brain as well. Yeah. I, and so th this is horrible framing. These people are obviously perfectly happy to be misunderstood as implying this is a law which would say that a kid could not receive a necessary procedure to save their life because they're right. transgender. Right. That's how this is framed. What it should say is in Alabama, you are not allowed to give children sex changes. For some reason, some perverts are mad about that. So uh, the interesting thing about medical care is that I wonder, uh, does medical care in, in a general sense include psychotherapy? Well, yeah. Well, let, let me, let me, let me, okay. okay just, can I make a point on that real fast? I just, well, just a simple question. The answer is yes. We all, we all agree. And then my point was in Scandinavian countries, they don't do child sex changes. They do psychotherapy. Mm. But in the United States, they argue that's conversion therapy and wrong and shouldn't be allowed. Well, I was just going to say that the, the problem we're seeing today is, has nothing to do with science. And I think we should have seen back in the day when uh, the humanities were usurped educationally. It wasn't by, by accident. We'd make fun of them like, oh, do you want to go take a class to where you discuss how you feel about an author's book in the American Dream and Great Gatsby? Or do you want to study engineering? Not realizing that the great thinkers and the ideologues, the people who study the humanities and create these ideas, the philosophers, etc., that are out there, and even people that study English as we as we look down upon them, they took a hold of the subjects that we disregarded and they changed the language. They actually, from, from the ground up, have redefined the ability to define terms. The average person doesn't know what science is. They don't really understand engineering, but they can read a news article written for a fourth grade level reader. And so I, I was talking to a, a transgender Antifa, we were talking about this earlier, a tra trans Tifa uh, uh, and Satanist on, on uh, TikTok Live. And the key thing is here, and I, and I noticed this with every argument, all we're battling over then is words. So we mock English teachers like, oh, it's just English. You went to school for English. Well, currently, the battle isn't actually in science. It's English. It's, it's defining actually our dictionary and what words mean in terminology. Even biology is mostly just built up of terms. And I mean, yes, Latin and whatnot. But I asked him, I, I, go, I go, the guy goes, you know, legitimately, there is fascistic genocide of trans people all around this country, and you're defending it. And I go, fascistic genocide? Where in the world do you see fascistic genocide? I'm serious. I said, I want to know. Because oh, you're China. Well, no, but he, but he said this well, to me. No, but of trans kids. No, but of trans kids. That's almost like a pets right, right, right now. Mm -hmm. But uh, mm -hmm. the rest of me is Shanghai. But he, goes, but he goes, yeah. And I go, where is this? So he goes, oh, well, in the Texas laws. And I'm like, I'm in Texas. I'm very familiar with the Texas trans laws right now. And there's no genocide happening. So he goes on to define and goes, genocide. And I said, what is genocide, man? What is that? And that's what we have to ask him. What do you mean now by genocide? Because we have no absolute truth. He goes, well... You know, that that's taking kids away from parent parents who, who want to get, you know, gender reaffirming surgery and hormone therapy. And, you know, and I'm like, that's weird for me because I thought 
genocide involved killing and all the genocidal maniacs and tyrants over the years apparently wasted a lot of resources they could have just used see you know child protective services and took the kids away for two weeks and they would have done i guess the racial cleansing that they desired but i go well what are you talking about and then he brings up the fact uh you know as per mentioned that you know this is this new thing called social murder and so this idea of the fact that if you withhold trans uh reaffirming and i'm using their words reaffirming surgery you are leading to the increased suicide rate of trans kids therefore your actions are the murderous actions and your choice to limit is murder and i'm not defending this no, I'm, sure. i was sitting there mind blown going dude and the best part about this is i gotta ask i said when did you start hormones he goes, he goes it saved my life it saved my life he goes well 22 I go, okay, uh, so you're saying that hormones saved your life at 22? I hope you were past puberty by 22. Mm -hmm. So you're a 22-year-old who started taking estradiol and different types of blockers and whatnot at 22, and now you're trying to tell me what a 9-year-old should be doing? Buddy. Mm -hmm. did, you see well, the, did you see the article in the Washington Post? It was an op-ed by a oh. writer named Corinne Cohn who mm -hmm. was talking about how, um, I don't know what the pronoun is to use in this case. Anyway, um, Corinne mm -hmm. was saying that at 19... Uh, yeah, here, this is, yeah, this is a story, Tim. At 19, um, Cohn had, uh, was castrated. This mm. was intentional. Um, and then it turns out that actually he would have been a gay man and has never had a sexual experience. Um, when he talk, you know, talks to friends and friends are very dismayed by this. And in the, in the article, Corinne talks about how uh, never having experienced this, you know, they don't really know what they're missing. And I just find this to be so sad that we are taking away the sexual futures of so many of these of these kids, mm. uh, not just their reproductive futures, but any real chance at intimacy. You yeah, know, they're giving up something that they don't that they don't know. They what don't it understand. Is. And they, right. they're, they're giving it up for the rest of their lives. And that's why the way this is all framed, that this is, um, you know, this is the, we're infringing on the rights of the child. No, none of these laws are restricting the child this is about restricting you as the adult we're saying that yes, you that's correct. cannot do that to you a child amen and the, to the, the idea that a, that a child has like that their rights are being infringed upon because they're not being mutilated is is horrific i, I just want to make one other point too elijah brought up the uh the words and the, mm -hmm. and the way that words are manipulated i think this is really important because what we have to, what we have to understand is on the other side the sane side of this trans discussion we are so behind we're, we're playing catch up right now because mm -hmm. the language is so totally controlled by the left, even to the extent of every time we use the word gender, we are actually assenting to the left's framework. Yes, that's yep. correct. That word itself was that was introduced into the language the way that it's used now by the people who invented gender ideology for the purpose of mainstreaming it. So and by yeah, a pedophile and it's, it's specifically, actually, John Money. It's actually really fascinating too the the whole language thing because um, I was in the arts for most of my most of my career, most of my adult life, and I could see this you know this starting and you know artists started becoming arts activists instead, and it started being like, oh, when you do, when you write a play, it should be. Um, it should be not just art, not just aesthetic, but there needs to be this activist backbone to it. Mm -hmm. And you could see people changing the language intentionally. And it started, you know, we had the whole PC thing. Don't say, you know, black, say African-American. Don't say, you know, I don't know, woman, say some other stupid woman, word. Yeah. Right? Well, like, also <laughs> it's but, but I mean, we saw this happen. It's been happening for a long time. And at first, just like it is now with the whole gender thing, at first it was sold to us with the idea of compassion behind it, right? It's more compassionate to use these terms. Um, it makes other people feel better. It's not offensive if you t if you speak about it this way. And we have con consistently allowed ourselves to be bludgeoned with this idea of the compassionate way I, to I talk wanna, to people, and we're still there. I want to just ask, you know, uh, it's a legitimate question that I know we'll never get answered because the response on the left will be like, it's a bad faith question. Um, if, if a kid was, uh, there, there's general body dysmorphia, dysphoric disorder or something like that, uh, I talked about this on the Joe Rogan podcast with Jack Dorsey. If someone, and they do, they feel like their fingers need to be removed. They, they feel like their hand is transabled. This is a thing. Well, this, this is, is a thing. Th yeah, it's, it's, it's like general body dysmorphic disorder or something mm -hmm. like that. Would we then say for the health and safety of the child, we will remove their perfectly functioning yeah. hand? And the other question on top of that is we've seen uh, young girls get double mastectomies at the age of even 13. Uh, again, I posted this on Twitter. There's a study that was done in 2018 looking at the the results of you know the quality of life would we give a 13 year old boy large breast implants if he said that they would make him feel better and he was depressed mm -hmm. i think overwhelmingly most parents 
even parents who want to affirm their kids, they'd probably look at that and think twice and be like, wait a minute, this doesn't seem right because breast implants are not typically associated with someone seeking to, uh, like a young boy who's feeling you know, depressed. And even a young girl wouldn't have double Ds or something like that. But I'm wondering at what point we actually start seeing this. Yeah. So obviously at the present moment, the left would at the very least pretend to be horrified by the idea of removing a child's pinky because they've decided that they don't want to have it at an early age. But if you ask any grown man, what would you rather have happened? Would you rather have lost your pinky finger as a child or would you rather have lost the ability to fully develop reproductively as a child? Any man would tell you he would rather have lost his pinky. It's not even a question. Well, hold on there. Maybe. But if you don't go through puberty, you, you don't develop that. Uh... No, that's my point. Well, so, so if you ask someone who is, has been, um, had their gonads removed, that's, that's what this article describes it as gonad destruction, mm. before... Like a heavy metal band. <laughs> gonad destruction. Before, <laughs> yeah. before puberty, they're not going to know what they lost, and they're not going to de desire things they haven't developed desire for. I don't know about that. I think they'll, be, they'll look at healthy married couples and say, I wish I could have had something like that, yeah, because well, there's I, an innate I, drive I within the with human that. person. This has to... been, you just brought up John Money, and this is, yeah. so we, we have a case study in this. And um, I was like, John Money did that. He's the guy who invented gender ideology. And he did that to a young boy, a baby. Baby. Yeah. Uh, castrated a, a young boy um, and told the, told the parents to raise the boy as a girl. And, but it didn't, the girl identity didn't take hold because he's, he's not a girl. So eventually they even they with, with switch back. Yeah, even, that was even, a yeah. even with hormones. And killed himself later in life. Mm -hmm. yeah. Him, him and his the, brother both and killed the brother, both did. Yeah. And um, he performed sexual however, experiments on them as well. He, he was a, as well, he was a disgusting pervert on every but level. But this is, this is actually an argument uh, the left counters with that uh, it proves gender, uh, gender identity is inherent in a person, right? That even though this person who didn't choose to went through this, later in life they said, no, I am male and always was. The left argues that certainly there are people who are who are born male or female and then later come to realize they have an alternate gender identity. Well, what the left, I mean, sex is inherent. A person does have a sex. Gender is a completely nonsensical term that was first developed by the man who performed this sick sexual experiment on children. It was a complete failure, but he reported it as a success. It was printed in medical textbooks as a, as a success. And as a matter of policy in many hospitals, as a result of his lies, many boys who underwent botched circumcision were transitioned as infants. Yeah, that was messed yeah, up. Yeah, and I, I, I've heard that claim from, from the other side saying, oh, no, that John Money actually proves that we're right. But no, that if, if gender is determined partially by society and environment and everything, then, and that's what John Money believed, he's the guy who came up with this stuff, it, then this should have worked and it didn't. So he, he actually disproved his own theory in this, in this horrific years-long experiment that he ran on these kids. The thing about gender, you have the definition up there, I mean... It, Originally, gender is a linguistic term that refers to, to words. Like, words have gender, masculine or feminine. And John Money is the one who said that, oh, no, people have gender, too. People have a gender and a sex. Yeah, so and then, you, and then you, but you notice something else. Because they said that people have a gender and a sex, and they're two different things. And that's, and that's what they went with for, for decades. And now they're kind of collapsing the distinction again. And they're actually, they, they've, they've actually gotten away from that. And now they're, now they're basically saying that gender and sex are the same thing because a trans woman is a woman. It's exactly the same thing as a woman. They, they will not allow anymore that a, quote, trans woman is, um, is a male. They, they'll, they'll say right. a trans woman is a female. So well, they've, the, they've gotten rid of the distinction themselves. And they're enshrining this in law. I mean, now the, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 protects gender identity in the same way that it protects, you know, Women that, that or, wasn't that was amended uh, nationally. It, well, it, it's not like they haven't gone back and rewritten the amendment, but the executive orders that Biden signed essentially do that. Well, in uh, uh, most states, have actually passed uh, these these civil rights amendments that say gender identity is, is protected as well. The question then is, how do you define gender identity? And this is where things get more difficult. In New York, for instance, it's defined as a person's self-expression. Because, uh, you know, I, I pulled up the word gender on Wikipedia and it says the range of characteristic characteristics pertaining to femininity and masculinity and differentiating between them. The challenge is the uh, modern left ideology suggests that a dress is not inherently feminine or masculine, in which case it's not a part of gender. So if you have somebody who has long hair and wears makeup and, you know, wears bras and, and female clothing, that isn't, according to their own I ideology, inherently feminine and gendered, in which case... The whole thing starts to become illogical, I suppose. Well, in that, that, yeah. how, how, does, how does a child know they're transgender if a little girl says she likes playing with trucks in the color blue? 
they might say, well, you like things boys like. No, because girls can like trucks in the color blue, same as well, anybody they're, else. Well, they're trying to have it both ways. They're both telling us that gender stereotypes are a problem and need to be abolished and that you can tell what your gender identity is based on which gender stereotypes you adhere to. And both I, things can't be true. I, I, I really do think that um, for the most part, it's not that they're trying to have both. Technically, that's the case. It's that there is no truth but power to these people. Right. So any that's circumstance true, in which they can assert something to gain power, they do. And that's why they often contradict themselves. Mm -hmm. Then we sit here as logical beings trying to understand mm -hmm. the map they've created in terms of logic. And it makes no sense to us. Yeah. yeah. And, and breaking down sexual boundaries is fantastic if you're in a position of power. And rather than having a healthy functioning society, you'd rather have one where people look up to and they're very easy to control. And the best way to break down sex relationships, the best way to break, uh, break down the family after you've already done things like uh, made uh, contraceptives widely available and so socially acceptable is to go for the actual direct definition of sexuality and completely collapse it so that the sexes have no hope of ever developing any understanding of how they should relate to each other from their society. Right. So let, let, let's talk about what's happening with um, with kids here, because we have this story from Fox News. New Jersey sample lesson plans push videos for fifth graders on graphic sex related content. Um, I mean, this was the stuff released by Lips of TikTok, right? Was this the, the, the New yeah, Jersey she, stuff? Well, right. she started it, yeah. Yep. I just wanted to give her credit. Yeah, I appreciate Yeah, her. so yeah, sure. it, it seems like we're seeing an inversion almost of what Florida is doing, where Florida's mm -hmm. like, hey, look, you know, uh, third grade and below, it's, it's, it's hands off. After, you know, fourth grade and up, you can have these conversations without parental consent, which I also think is still kind of crazy because parents should be signing off on, you know, curriculum and knowing what's going on. But now we're seeing uh, schools having a graphic sex related content for for even fifth graders i think this is a great um this is a great argument for chris rufo's whole transparency and education thing which i which i love this idea that curriculum needs to be posted before the beginning of the year so you can see what's going on i like it for this reason and i like it just so that i would know what my kid is up to and i can like help study what's interesting in new york is you have uh the unelected governor kathy hochul pushing for um you know similar kinds of stuff as new jersey uh thoroughly opposed to the um parental rights and education bill in florida and you have um andrew giuliani who is also running for governor saying that he's interested in having a parental rights and education bill in new york i think it's going to come down to i think a lot of that's going to um really come up in that in that in that in that uh what do you call well, it race yeah, that, uh, in that race I was just going to yeah. say with this stuff is what's so insane is that um, with talking to the kids about the stuff, I, I've looked at some of these uh, lesson plans, of course, just out of educational responsibility, not because uh, I wanted to learn. And in the way that they actually teach the kids about sex is so inaccurate. It's absolutely crazy. So you thought porn was a bad educator for children. It is kind of crazy. They're now talking about uh, they start they're not calling people kids anymore, and they're not using the difference between adults and children, but they're using this phrase called young people, mm -hmm. which is this idea of children. So that's the new hot phrase that they're using, young people, and this idea of taking away man and woman, old and young, adult and child, and everyone's a person X, like a Latinx. We're all vague and we're all a person, and there's this level of maturity. I know we we talked about this before the show, but uh, some of these educational sites that have porn on them to teach kids about the websites, you can check them out. They're cartoon. Porn and unless you got some really weird fetishes, I don't think you're going to get stumbled. I don't think you're going to really like them a lot. But you go to click in and it asks you if you're in a, if you have, it says by federal law, you have to be 18 to enter the site. Then asks if you're mature enough. And when you get in there, the lessons on sex for kids are so strange. If somebody had told me that's what sex is, like the one I saw up front was they were like, sometimes you get an erection, you get horny. And the guy's penis was the size of his torso. It was like it was like this big. And I'm going, OK, I understand exaggeration in art. But if we're going to teach kids about accu accuracies of sex, why are you using cartoons with penises this four feet long? It's take, very weird. Take a look at this story. It's from TimCast.com. Maryland Department of Education will require pre-K students to learn about gender identity mm -hmm. and expression. Mm -hmm. The state's health curriculum curriculum aims to examine how racism impacts sexual identity oh by middle school. Gosh. I want to break this Wait, one down. Wait, how racism <laughs> impacts? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> gender identity right, by but, middle but, school? But so, so, so hold on. Oh, okay. I, got, I got a bone <laughs> to pick with this year, TimCast.com. Is it a oh, four foot on? long bone? Will require? Oh, when you actually sorry. pull up the document, it actually <laughs> has on it uh, uh, pre-kindergarten through high school, 1st July 2020 <gasps> to June 2021. There it sounds it like does. they're already doing it. And now I have questions about the website, but the website is, is, is linked through the Maryland.gov portal. So this is coming out of Maryland's public school website, this document talking about pre-kindergarten through high school and what they're going to be teaching these kids. 
I don't think that it's in it, it's it's a it's planned opposition to what's happening in Florida. I think what what Florida is is in effective opposition to what they've already right. been doing. Yeah, and, well, is, and it was is, already happening in Florida too. And right. this is uh, by the way talking about the history of things. I mean, comprehensive sex education that started with with Alfred Kinsey, who's another pedophile, and yep. and, yep. Uh, and 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 expressly wanted to and unbelie- wanted to sexualize children, believe that children are sexual literally from birth, mm-hmm. and it's a whole story there. It's totally horrifying, but comprehensive comprehensive sex education goes back to him. It starts there, and so it is a from the beginning, an effort to sexualize children, to sexualize them also kind of based in this kind of circular way on the idea that children are already sexual from birth. And the thing about that that's so insidious because we see that, oh, they're teaching this stuff to preschoolers, we find it so shocking, and it is. I mean, it's horrifying, but it's actually not surprising because, well, of course they want to get to the kids that young because when you're that, when you're four years old, I mean, these are the kids who believe, you know, in Santa Claus, they, like, they, they think that Spider-Man is real. So, th- at that age, psychologically, they cannot distinguish. They actually cannot distinguish between, between reality and fantasy. If you go to a four-year-old and you say to the four-year-old, Superman doesn't exist, they won't even know what you mean by that. It doesn't mean anything. It doesn't exist. Right. What do you mean? I can see him on TV. I know he exists. And so that's the, the left's ideas, about, especially about gender, are so ridiculous and insane that they have to get to the kids that young at an age where they, where they don't have the mental capacity to see it for the absurdity that it is. Well, and if you can indoctrinate them that young, then you get them, you know, potentially for life. What's funny to me is uh, that's what I was told growing up about Christianity mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. was that the church goes, goes, tries to get the kids so that they grow up indoctrinated in the church and dogma and things like that. And now we're, I, I got to say, it is fascinating to see that when, when it comes to critical race theory, gender ideology, and the general woke, woke cult, it seems that they're doing a lot of what the left claimed the right did a long time ago. Like they're, and, they're arguing the other side right. does it, but they're doing and it. And the difference is, so yeah, you hear that argument about that. That's what that's re- what, what religions do, and the left makes that argument. It's actually interesting because what they're essentially admitting is that gender ideology is a religion, and so that part I agree with them. At least we have it in the right category. Mm. It's actually a religious <laughs> point of view. But the difference is that um, with Christianity, you you can ask really difficult questions, and in fact, for most Christians who are informed, like they want to have that conversation. Let's talk about it. Why do I believe in the Bible? Why do I believe in God? I'll, let's have the conversation. It's it, it's great. Um, with gender ideology, though, and this is why they have to get to the kids very young. It collapses under the slightest scrutiny. They cannot answer like any questions about it. Ask them well, to like, define their terms. They can't do it, and so that's that's well. Why. That's why they like resort said, to insults instead. Right, right, right. And it's like it's like I, like I asked. Um, you know, look, whenever this topic comes up, we invariably uh, mention the Jack Dorsey Rogan podcast because I, you know, this conversation was about censorship. But I said to Jack, your rules are inherently biased. And he said, no, they aren't. And I said, you have a misgendering policy that enforces the left's worldview on what misgendering means. The right thinks misgendering is if someone is biologically male or female, you use inverted pronouns. And the left thinks if someone chooses to use pronouns, you don't use them. You've decided to enforce what the left thinks. I asked, would you enforce these rules? And he was like, well, look, we do this because there's high suicide rates and we're trying to protect people. And I said, sure. But you don't do that for anyone else who's suicidal. You yep. don't say you can't disparage police officers or dentists. Mm-hmm. You don't say that you can't disparage people who are who are dysmorphic in terms of anorexia or bulimia. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, soldiers have an insane, combat veterans have an insanely high suicide rate. Nobody says that means no, we can't criticize U.S. foreign that's, policy. That's not true. That's, that, that is a bannable offense on YouTube. YouTube. Yeah. You, wait, wait. Criticizing U.S. foreign policy is a bannable offense no, no, because no, no. of combat no, no, no. veterans. Actually, suicide? technically, it can be demonetized if you talk about Ukraine or Russia the wrong way. Now, that is, that is absolutely true. The rules actually say I, I'm pretty sure YouTube says you'll be banned for disparaging someone based on their veteran status. Yeah, but that's different. That's different. That, that's not. Um, if you're disparaging someone for their veteran status, that's different see, from I criticizing see. the broader ideology if you in died which for they've nothing, taken right? a part of. Th- yes, that's the exactly. point. Right, you, right, right. You're, you're saying, hey, like, and I've heard people say this all the time, we should have never been in that war, you know, and I, I've literally watched this not only on, on YouTube, but in every social media, something to this regard of going, yeah, you know, imagine your brother died in Afghanistan and then you see now the pullout, especially when we were leaving and that the war, they say, was for nothing. And what do you feel about your brother's death? I mean, that would be something that I would say as a family member, imagine I'm heartbroken and I'm sitting there and someone's and railing onto it. It might put me in a position where I would feel unstable emotionally. Does my life matter? But I also think that the key thing about the trans thing you have to realize is like, I, I this is going to sound crazy to some people. But I think you can't talk about this without being somewhat theological, or at least if you're not theological, metaphysical, you could put it into this. There 
is a depopulation agenda, and it seems that we always prioritize the social issues that lead to depopulation. It's like whether it's the trans identity, whether it's uh, and we target when they're young, specifically in puberty. We're not fighting for transsexual adults. We're fighting for transgenderism, a, mi a state of mind, specifically in kids. It's for abortion in the womb. It's for climate change and reducing our emission and the amount of people and the carbon footprint. It's about reducing our intake, biosynthetic meat, about not having access to things. When you look at the amalgamation of all of the targets of the, the, the global agenda, I'd say the Western global agenda, uh, specifically EU, United States, the Five Eyes, etc. So when you go there, it all seems hell-bent on somehow bringing this down. Now, now that, this is not antithetical to what the actual elites talk about very regularly in Davos and also to just openly like on public forums. And I hate to be like the Bill Gates guy, but I just people talk about there's too many people. There's too many. And there's just fuels. not. I know, but I'm yeah. saying, but no, I totally, I agree so, with so, you. So, but yeah. that, that's where the social issues yeah, go. It's really what fascinating. What is the common link? The what? common link is about making us less accessible to resources, to ideas, to expand, to grow, and to, to shrinking, but, but shrinking the, the population. I, I would say um, perhaps the, these pieces line up. But I would also be careful because that that's the territory where you're, you're, you're far removed from the average person who doesn't understand what's going on. It's very, very simple to go to a, a, a middle class working family and say, you know, would you be in support of your 13 year old son getting large breast implants and them being like, excuse me, get out of my house. It's much more, it's Watching much different if you today. go to them and say, let me break down very quickly for you this depopulation depop agenda, why I think they're doing these things. This is, this is the issue. Um, you know, it was really funny. I went on Candace, uh, Candace Owens' show earlier. And uh, she was fantastic, by the way. But she mentioned, uh, we were talking about Alex Jones and how, you know, a lot of what he says might be too colorful for regular people to understand. When he, you know, I mentioned the, the media comes out and says, you know, he's yelling the frogs are gay or whatever. And she was like, but he was right. I mean, <laughs> not overtly about frogs being gay, but that, you know, there's a chemical that was, you know, causing problems and, you know, for frogs. And I said, right, right, a chemical called atrazine was reportedly uh, interfering with the endocrine systems of frogs. And Alex Jones yelled out, turn on the frogs gay or whatever. And uh, the media takes that to poison the well. So I try to be careful with messaging, but I, I get what you're saying. I think it, it's, it's more tactful to just approach the issues uh, individually because I think most regular working people agree that individually these things are all, are, are, are all issues we're facing. Well, it is interesting, I think, with the climate change specifically because um, there is this, uh, you, you guys have heard of Extinction Rebellion. Oh, I've oh, yeah. met right? a lot of those yeah, guys yeah, before. Yeah. Very fun people. So they're very opposed to anybody having children. Right. I hope they don't have. And any. I hope they, you know, maybe they don't have them. But um, <laughs> but that's sort of the idea is that like people should not have children, that it's a drain on the Earth's resources and all of this. But it's like the less people we have, the less resources we're going to have because there's going to be less people to do the work to gather the resources or to create the new things. And this well, is well, actually to, to, well, this to is be fair real quick. They're saying the amount of, say, uh, oil in the ground will be consumed by a billion people, but a million people will consume a, a, you know, ma order of magnitude, several order of magnitude, uh, several orders of magnitude less. Mm -hmm. They're not saying that they're, you know, like, I understand what you mean. There'll be less refined resources, but their argument is... Yeah, it's so rare we can't even, we can't even uh, well, they drill value, for more. Well, so. they value the earth over the earth's well, inhabitants. Well, yeah. Exactly. And, right. and so, that's an issue. So I would make and two points. First, well, can I, yeah, so firstly, what you're saying is verified by basically all of the statistics that we have on population growth and wealth. World population has exploded and global poverty has decreased significantly in that time. Exactly. Human beings have a remarkable ability not only to provide for themselves, but for others as well. And so the left has this way of looking at resources, which is very fixed pie and very childish. They think that there's just been this fixed number of resources that we've had access to from the beginning of time, and we've been slowly dwindling them down, failing to comprehend the fact that as new people with new minds come along, they find new ways to use what we already have and ways to use what we thought was useless in the past. Ben Shapiro made an excellent point. I saw this viral video where he was asked about climate change and why he didn't think it was an emergency. I think he gave a very verbose answer, but huh. his uh, his ending okay, point, his, his last point was he doesn't think it's a disaster because the uh, um, the predictions don't account for mitigation factors, mm. meaning, you know, uh, they look at these these charts and say, oh, we're going to have uh, uh, 10 feet of water rise in 100 years, burying cities 200 feet in, in, you know, in, the, in the next thousand, and it's going to wipe out all these cities. And it's like, right, right, right. And you're not accounting for the fact that human adaptation happens. Right. Which you, you go back to that famous story about horse manure in New York. You're familiar with this one? Yeah. They I said, so. at the turn of the century, we are going to be buried under horse manure in New York City because there's too many horses and too much manure. Well, they kind of are. Yeah. Well, and they're then, buried under human well, manure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> but, but then they invented the car. And all of a sudden, the horse manure problem changed. Now, yeah. 
I, I do think there, there's, there's an obvious mathematical equation that the planet can only sustain so many human beings. And I don't know uh, how many, how, how, I don't know what that number is. I don't think we've got there yet. But we're, we're not I, anywhere I, I, close. I'm not entirely sure I agree. I think, you know, a, a lot of people talk about, look, there's not that many humans. The planet is almost entirely empty. It's like, yes, but are there enough humans to disrupt a, sim, uh, a, a large chemical process, say, in the North Atlantic current? My, my issue is I do think population density is a huge problem. New York is a large concrete block that can't sustain itself. And it creates massive pools of waste and insane. Yeah, that's but that's the problem is is the way humans are choosing to congregate. But you could take the entire population of the globe and put them in Texas, and they they still have, they still have a good amount of space. It's just that we, you know, you have, you have these vast expanses of land that aren't used, and we, we choose to to pile into cities and so on. So that's but that, that's true. But consider this, um, you know, you could take the entire you said the, the entire population of the planet, pile them in Texas, right? It's, yeah. But uh, real you know, estate everybody prices. would have how, a nice. How, uh, how much ammonia? needs to be produced to disrupt uh, the, the, you know, the, the ocean's ecosystem or, or, or a natural uh, cycle of like, the ecosystem on this planet. It, it, we don't need to flood the planet with ammonia. We don't need to, f but, or, or you know, other chemicals, but humans do produce waste products. And it's not just you know, the human literal waste products. It's uh, uh, chemical byproducts and plastics. So my, my concern is the amount of waste produced by humans to disrupt the entire planet is probably not as, it, it's not going to be like you know, 10% of the planet's surface of garbage destroys the planet. It could be 0.01 causes a chemical disruption, which disrupts the ecosystem. We've seen things like dead zones in the Gulf, dead mm -hmm. zones in oceans where there's no oxygen and no, no life can, can, can live. And there's the North Pacific garbage gyre. The garbage gyres are yeah. really, really bad. Yeah. And uh, this has uh, an impact on life cycles well, that's for the entire planet. Like that, for example, is not a population problem per se. It's just what the people trash are choosing to do. It's, it's like it's like a, you right. know these. You, you could go to uh, some of these rivers in Asia are just moving garbage dumps. People are just throwing mm -hmm. uh, their their uh, waste products into the river. Meanwhile, like in in America, we're blaming ourselves because of our plastic straws or whatever. And now we got paper straws and they suck. Oh, right. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And, then you, and masks everywhere. Right. And then you, They're you, everywhere. Like the mask yeah. thing, they they choke the trees the way plastic bags used to. But then but, you got you got other parts of the world, and it's like they're the rivers are literally just like conveyor belts for for but, trash but, out to the ocean. But that's that's a that's no, no, what I, people I, are choosing to do. Sure, you don't sure. have to do that. But scale it up. But as, now we have at, microplastics at certain, in our bodies, sure, sure, but right? Eliminate human technological byproducts. There is a point at which humans fart themselves to death. Yeast does it in in, in a bottle. But the, the I'm question not saying, is, I'm are not we saying even... we're there. I don't know where it will be, but mathematically, it's ob it's obvious that it exists. Now, my point on top of this is, so I, I think pollution is a, is a is a problem. I think we should be aware of that and do our best to mitigate that, to live as clean as possible, minimize our entropy, maximize our entropy. But also in the process, we should be colonizing other planets. We should be doing scientific mm. advancement. We should be launching space stations. I think we should be doing all of that stuff. Yeah. I think we should be totally like using the resources we have to bust why? out of the solar system. Why? why? I mean, why? I mean, I mean, because why? we are a race of explorers, and I mean, exploring, there's curiosity, sure, but, well, but well, I'll, I'll, what's I'll, out I'll there? I'll simplify it. I'll simplify it. Let's why for, see you why. Say, but it's for context. fun. Well, like, no, but literally saying, no, no, for no, no, fun. I'll give you a real <laughs> answer. <laughs> about, I Dude, I love how my answer is real. A real answer is fun. Is a real answer. Humanity could be wiped out by a single comet right now. If we had a but a small space station on Mars, the humans on Mars would be would not be impacted by a crisis on Earth in the same way making us more resilient and more prone I, I, to survival. That's a good I, reason, I, too. I, yeah, that I, and fun. Can, can and I actually say, I actually prefer the fun answer. <laughs> I think that's because just from, a, from you know, if you, if you try to argue that, like, from a practicality standpoint, we have to build colonies on Mars. I mean, Mars is, is the, 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 what would be required for, the, for our planet to be more inhospitable than Mars? I mean, it's like... Uh, at that point, probably humanity no longer exists anyway. I, I actually couldn't think, we like I, mine the asteroid yeah. belt. That would be cool. And that's the thing. No, I, I I actually <laughs> I'm Agreed. in favor of colonizing um, the solar system if we can. Not really because it's practically it makes a lot of practical sense, but just because that's what humanity yes. is meant to do. You're that's meant what we to do. just right to strive for the horizons. Mm -hmm. And I think when you stop doing that, then you're basically giving up on human civilization. I'm against it to be and, completely honest. I'm so in favor Gen Gen of space Gen because you're anti. <laughs> Colonialism. <laughs> yes, actually, because I don't want I don't want the rock monsters to have to identify with a new species. But should we should we be reaching out? Like we, we you know, we had the exploration mm. age when we were when you had people on ships and they well, were going across uncharted waters. 
And we don't have that anymore. I mean, so where, where do you go now? I mean, you go but up, when you look at the copious up. amounts of money that it's taking to fund this stuff, I, I bring up this problem with it. And, and this is an interesting perspective that I think really deviates if you hold like a Christian worldview or an atheist worldview that I think we have to understand. Because obviously, if you're eschatologically you know, sound in some way, even if you are in another religion, but specifically Christianity, which is the major religion in the United States, you know, there's this understanding that at the end times, it says that people will be saying like life ha always has been and always will be. People will be given in marriage. They will be trading. When, when God comes to judge the world. In that way, then there's an understanding that judgment comes when God comes to judge the world and the end of the age and the end of the world is in God's hands and we're not going to just get struck with a comet. However, if you don't believe that, then I totally even understand what you're saying because that is a total probability. Like Scientifically, what you're saying, by the way, makes 100% logically to me. But I want to make this point, though, about the colonization is sometimes I think that humans, we, we have this uh, big man syndrome where I agree with the exploration and my wife was really having a difficult time. We, I've been watching like cave accidents and she was like, why are people Yikes. going into caves? <laughs> and, I, and, I, and, and this is where I would concede your point. I said, dude, exploration and this idea of, of, of pushing the boundaries is part of the human spirit that God gave us. But going into space is sort of a taxpayer funded burden that I feel in many ways. I mean, the private, the privatization of it, what's happening now is still very interesting as we're moving in that. But overall, it's been very costly. And I've always wondered, those resources and that movement with going to Mars almost seems like a distraction. Like we talk about, you know, you, you, he's you going will. into space. And I it's get like, it, I get it, we but... have problems here no, 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 that I don't on. think those actually solve. Yeah, but when we start exploring. You know, there's, there's, a points, you know, there's a couple points that have to be made. I know it's an unpopular. Right solves Hold on, other problems. Points. Uh, yes, technological advancements that came from taxpayer-funded space exploration, sure, like plastics, I, I, yeah, for instance, yeah. and the money is spent doesn't leave anywhere. It's cycled into the economy, and it's good for the economy that people are working on these technologies. Often, when we have factories machining a lot of these parts, they remain and can machine other parts. So technological technological advancement is just good across the board. Hey, also, I, it I, lets I, us dream. Yeah. It, it gives us oh, it gives us a place to put our our fantasies and our imaginings and our hopes for the future. Here's a you're, you're asking what problem does it solve? Well, I think our, our most fundamental problem in our society right now is, is like malaise and despair. People have just given up on life, given up on life having any meaning. And I'm not saying that space exploration solves that, but it, is, it's a, it, is a, it, it helps anyway in that regard. I mean, when was the last time that the United States of America were like united over, together over something good that happened, celebrating a good thing that happened? When's the last time that, ever, that, that, that we had that United States? Probably the moon landing. I was going to say since yeah. Chauvin got convicted, uh, that, that was the last time I saw everyone. That was a little that, I, I really think the moon, landing, the moon landing was the last time that the United States had a good thing that everybody together was cheering. Um, and so not even Caitlyn Jenner no, no but the I, argument well, the, that, ar the argument Jenner. there the argument there Matt is this is that I, and I, and I want to say this people even argue whether that happened or not I don't have a strong opinion on the moon landing but I will say it, it definitely it happened. Well, I, I'm, no, I'm saying people just it have, really did happen people in the chat are going to argue I'm saying when you say that I'm saying but I'm not going to argue about I don't think this so idea. I think they're mostly going to say it happened okay I'm well I don't sure know I've been seeing movements growing what I'm saying is I don't want to get stuck on that I want to say yes I agree that moment was a total unifying factor and absolutely amazing. What space exploration appears to be today is, number one, the militarization of the outer hemispheres. Number two, it seems to be not a national idea of a space race of us coming together and having a national unity. It seems to be who can afford a ticket to go out into the solar system and actually get out there. It seems more like a, like another rich man's ploy to escape Earth. But here's the thing about that. But new technology always had, exists for the wealthy. And first. also we had, you know, we had a government-funded space program that has now brought us to a point where we have private citizens who are able to further space research. That's cool. That's part it's, of it. That's part of the capitalist undertaking. I'm, I'm not going to win anybody over here. No, I know no, that. But, but no, I, I genuinely, you're definitely not going to. Yeah. Seamus nailed it. I mean, imagine being like microwaves. So you, right. you need to cook your food 10 minutes faster. Rich people buy the stupidest thing. Just use this stuff. Well, eventually everybody gets it. But I want to ask a, a, an interesting question with the last few minutes we have before the Super Chats. Um, space travel. Gentlemen. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe everyone here is religious. Mm -hmm. Assuming aliens exist, should we not? Should should humans travel the stars to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ to aliens, to other planets, to other worlds? You it, know what's interesting about that? Uh, you want to go ahead? Yeah. Well, I, so ahead. this is actually actually an interesting question, and there's a podcast I love listening to. It's called Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World. I'm going to shout it out. He is a Catholic apologist. He's very brilliant, <laughs> and he'll talk about questions like this, which is not something you commonly get. So very unique. Fills a great niche. He did a whole episode on on the possibility of aliens and extraterrestrial life that I would really suggest the audience check out if they're interested in, in that kind of question. But I, I personally, I don't know that I would have much to uh, to say about that. I'm not sure the theological well, implications of extraterrestrial life. What do you guys think? What if they already know? Yeah. Right. 
Wouldn't it, would it be the craziest CS thing Lewis if like we there. land on this planet and we walk out and the first thing they say is, I'd like to, have, have you heard about our Lord and Savior Jesus right. Christ? And I mean, the like, other Whoa. thing too is it, it tells us in the gospel that the way to spread your faith is through kind acts and mm-hmm. by living that faith. Yeah, yeah it's a, I mean, C.S. Lewis talked a lot about this and wrote, you know, wrote science fiction. And so he even speculated about, because we believe in the Christian faith that we're a, we're a fallen species, could you have, if, 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 if there's another planet out there separated by light years and galaxies, could they even potentially be unfallen? Maybe they had their own choice, they made the right choice. And then what are the implications of us kind of mixing? Do we, do we almost become sort of like the serpents in the garden now where, where we are this, the, 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 the tempters? So it's an interesting question. I, I don't know what the answer to that is. It's kind of interesting to speculate. But. You, guys, you guys ever watch American Dad? <laughs> Sadly. Yeah. So uh, Roger the alien lives with them, but you know Stan, of course, they're, they're Christian. And so they, there's, a, there's a story arc where um, the, the, the apocalypse happens and the rapture happens. And then when you know, all the good people are raptured, Jesus is on Earth. And he sees Roger the alien. He goes, "Ugh, one of my father's side projects." Oh gosh, <laughs> I thought that was a funny joke. That's no, great. it is. That uh, is amazing. Do you believe in extraterrestrials? I do. Yeah. He loves. All them. right. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, to, to me, it just seems like a the, the classic argument I find really compelling, which is just like a mathematical certainty, basically. When you when you when you consider the expanse, the just the the sheer unimaginable size of of the universe, you got a hundred billion galaxies with a hundred billion stars in each one and then each surrounded by planets it's just the idea that 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 the entire thing is empty of life to me is a it's just an absurdity I and mean, i don't see any reason to assume that but i i think that if that if you someone who says that they think it's all empty it's like the it's almost like the burden of proof is on you in a way mm-hmm. that, that that's that's the more absurd i, 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 take, I, uh, I take in the opposite direction yeah. i hear what you're saying i think for me I, I would not eliminate it as a possibility, but I would say I would need to see some evidence or proof that they exist because the argument is often made there are so many planets that could potentially have life on them. Odds are there must be life there. But the problem with that is first, you're assuming that life arising is an odds game rather than an intentional uh, act by a creative God, which is what I believe. But even if it is an odds game, you're assuming that you have some idea of what the odds are. So let's say there's a billion habitable planets. Well, what if odds are only one in a billion? Then it would make sense that Earth is the only planet or with life. what well, if God in Tended to create life on other planets. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. That's, that's the thing. I, I, don't, I don't see it as an odds game, but I, I here's the way I look at it. It's like if you if you walk into a a giant mansion with like hundreds of rooms, and you're just right in the foyer, and then you kind of look around and say, "I think the whole place is empty." Mm. If you were to say that, then it's like, then I'm going to say to you, "Well, why are you assuming that?" It just it seems like the most logical thing to assume is that there's probably people in this well, house somewhere. What but if I think, it, what I if think it's there's totally a unfurnished and dusty, and there's no shoes around? And everything's covered but, but with all, but all, but in this, in And this, you've a, walked in. But in this analogy, all you see is literally the foyer. It's all you can see. Yeah, right, but I what's in say, the foyer? Like, what are we seeing? Are the tiles I'm cracked? Just gonna say, I'm just going to say, I'm not going to mock your, your perspective, actually, because, I mean, I think pe- somebody might come in and be like, <laughs> extraterrestrials. I know where you're coming from. I just feel like, for my, for my worldview, I genuinely believe yeah, that, that life was intentional. And because of how I believe the fallen nature of our of our closed universe really is i believe that the curse that god judges based off of the action of man it would be unfair to then judge that onto somebody else at least that's intelligent now if if there was something unintelligent or some smaller form of simpler life form obviously even the curse of man passes Mm. down to animals and lower life form here so i guess that could exist however i don't mock that because i do believe in the supernatural which is even crazier there's so many people that don't believe in god think the supernatural makes you a kooky guy but then they believe in aliens so i'm not going to do the opposite back and like say i I don't believe in aliens but i'm saying I believe in the supernatural. I, I do believe there's something else out there. I just do not believe it is physical, and I believe the physical was created here. Can I just point out too that I think I, th- I do think it's strange that there are atheists who believe in ghosts. Mm. That is yes, weird. and yeah. energy and stuff. I don't but here's that. the just, thing: you guys are talking about like where this fallen that human humanity has fallen. I think it's really sort of lucky that we were ejected from the garden and that we discovered our free will. And I think it gives us a much closer relationship with God to choose that relationship as opposed to just being, you know, the children in the garden who are naked and innocent. I think it's, you know, God gave us that free will. And now we have Uh, we have the free will to love God fully. Well, Well, we, we had free will from from the beginning, but now we live more separated from God because of the fall, which is. It's taking us down a path away from aliens, but, but I mean, it's, it's, but it also, I mean, without the that, there'd be, we would have no Jesus Christ. We would have no, like, we would not have this faith. 
Well, Jesus. It would just existed. be. It would be like a, a knowledge. It would not be a faith. Jesus has existed eternally, so we, we would still have Jesus Christ. Yeah, but there, there, would, there have, was no Jesus Christ in the Garden of Eden. There wouldn't like, have been a need. A, there wouldn't have been a need for a re, for a redemptive right. saving act. Right. I think so that, that would this, be a good thing. I think I don't. I, yeah, I disagree. But it, can I ask a question? I think well, it's good I, where we I, turned out. Yeah, I, I actually, I, I just want to clarify a little bit because you brought up this idea of going into a house and you see the foyer and there's a lot of rooms. My point is not that I'm dismissing the possibility or saying absolutely no, there's nothing out there. It's just that until I saw someone there or had an indication that there was someone there, I wouldn't assume that anyone else was in the house. Well, I, I think just the fact that the house exists and there's so many rooms is a pretty good... It's not proof, but it, mm -hmm. it, you have a pretty good reason to assume that there's probably people in it somewhere. So I, I think the assumption that it's empty is the one that needs... Well, I'm not even I'm not even necessarily saying it's empty. I'm just saying I in order to believe in aliens, I think I would have to say, yes, I think they're there. And I'm not prepared to say that, given what I know. So talk. So talking about the, the intentionality and God creates for a reason, which, of course, we all believe. So then what I would ask you guys is mm -hmm. we have all of these galaxies and solar systems that we can't even see. Like we 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 can't even look up at the sky and see that. Oh, it's a pretty light because the light hasn't even mm -hmm. reached us yet. And all just just trillions of planets. and everything. Why does any of that? exist maybe for us for it to be entirely empty but it's, it's maybe it's we, for us. We, we will never see it or go anywhere near it or know that it's there but it, oh. but it is there maybe we will one day maybe it's possible that it needs all of like that all of that is needed to support earth that's 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 true though so i watched this really excellent lecture by this uh very christian scientist he drew an interesting conclusion but what he said was jupiter is essentially a filter for the solar system mm -hmm. that its gravitational pull helps protect the inner planets mm -hmm. and that the earth should be peppered with much more space debris but jupiter protects us and so he went on to explain how we're actually quite fortunate that life has arisen on earth but it's because of the entirety of the solar system that created this machine that we don't realize in the in the long run that um perhaps in the development of life at whatever stage you know, one impact could have wiped out all life like we already know with the dinosaurs, assuming that is the, the correct uh, theory these days. They change it very often. But uh, Jupiter protects us. So uh, the shape of the solar system matters. I wonder if the rest of the universe matters, too. It's all part of one big machine. I don't know. I personally don't think that uh, I agree with you, Matt, that the expanse of the universe, I believe, suggests life probably exists somewhere else. I think so, too. Based on similar conditions on Earth, which we've witnessed and, and, and measured on other planets. You know, I, I hope to one, one one day humanity will get there. And we should totally go check it out. I hope I'm wrong on this one in some ways because I, being somebody who's, who really does love the, the physical approach to these things, it is so interesting that with everything we've put into space and everything that we've tried to understand that we have not found the viable forms of life we've actually tried to look for. And maybe we're just way behind in our development and our technology. And, and, I, and, I, and I, I am, I, I'm ashamed in that, in the fact that I do believe in, like, it's good to study the stars and understand paths and whatnot, but I also think, I don't know, going out there and just trying to find life on other planets. Well, that's, not, the, that's the point not the only... Is. We have found the life. The they come, they've come aim. here. They, the life has come here. It's like the our Navy pilots are seeing UFOs all over the place. Mm. They're, they're well, telling us about it. They're like, hey, guys, we got those UFOs, and we're all... But UFOs you know, don't well, mean what if, extraterrestrials. What if the, the, the reality is aliens have already come here, quite uh, normally and boringly as, say, tourists, but they get stopped by intergovernmental panels who are like, humans do not know about this. You cannot come to this This is planet. one of my favorite sci-fi things is when <laughs> yeah. humans don't know anything about extraterrestrials and then, like, some bureaucratic government somewhere else in the universe is like, just get rid of Earth. we got to put a highway there. Yes. I Dark love that. Well, uh, of course. Hitch Hitchhiker's Guide. Of course. Yeah. What if, but what it if... happens in other stuff, too, where they're just like, get rid of Earth. I love, me, I love that story. Let me, let me ask you guys. Uh, so I, <laughs> we, have, really we, have, we, have, uh, we have launched Chicken City, which, of course, I'm extremely proud of. One of the most super chatted shows in the world already. And uh, do these chickens know what's going on outside the chicken coop? They have no idea what exists outside there. They don't even well, know what's so going on in there. They don't even know about right? the what disco if, party. What if uh, they're confused by it? Right. What if we are? What if Earth is a chicken coop? In, right. in, in essence, a, 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 analogous to a chicken coop, where aliens know that we're here and they just sit back and watch and they're live streaming it. You know, I mean, South Park did the the, the gag that aliens use Earth as a as a reality show. Sure. Or it's, you know, Ukraine what if we're generate a, some super chats. You know, well, what, it's, I mean? it's, what if we're it's, just it's a cherry in a bowl of cereal? It's, it's the it's the uh, great zoo hypothesis to mm -hmm. uh, Fermi's paradox that maybe we are just a great zoo for the universe. And the reason, you know, all these other great civilizations talk to each other all the time. And then Earth is just entertainment for them. So we're just 
not 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 relevant and that's okay. why they're not getting back to us on our gold record that we sent <laughs> yeah. out right. there they're <laughs> laughing at it they're just like what they the sent us these weird this? naked pictures what is I, going I, on? I don't they, okay. they sent us lewd images <laughs> yeah, and we're offended like by it so I, I think it's i think it's possible i think it's i think it's it's sort of depressing i always go with the more depressing theory which is that um which is that like maybe civilization just reaches a point where it can't progress any it's just, you, you reach a certain point where self-destruction is inevitable well Fermi paradox well well yeah, actually Seamus yeah. said we, we were we were spitballing some ideas and Seamus had a great idea where it's like the year is 2270 and like some guy travels to the future and everything's the exact same <laughs> yeah that's right and, and they're like yeah. that that was it that, yeah we this, stopped yeah we stopped yeah. this is the peak of technology there's nothing else mm -hmm. just 2022 that was it huh they, they dropped the iphone 12 and we're like well <laughs> not, nothing else to do yep. i guess we're done we're satisfied all right how about we go to super chats if you have not already my friends smash that like button subscribe to this channel share the show with your friends subscribe to timcast.com we're gonna have an excellent extra spicy members only show over at timcast.com going up at 11 p.m eastern but for now we will read your super chats and see what you have to say about our uh, our crazy conversation that we've been going through all right sean turner says LOL, live bird poop drop on Biden today was rolling on the floor laughing. That's just today. I thought it's happened before. Did you guys, you guys saw this? I only heard about it Come when Libby mentioned it. Man. That Biden got pooped on. I yeah, it was kind of funny. That was pretty funny. <laughs> yeah, there's a, little, there's a conspiracy around it, right? Because it's not clear if he was pooped. I didn't see the video. but there's, Really? There's it a, looks like pretty poopy. Does it? Okay. Oh, yeah. I thought, oh, last time he pooped his pants, allegedly, right? That's yeah, what it was. I heard that thing, story, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I don't know anymore with him because it's almost like the conspiracies are less bad than the reality. Uh, well, can I ask he you something? He fell up the stairs. We can saw I, from your video. Th this is, this yeah. is the sad question, right? But would you think any differently of him had he defecated in his pants? I'm nope. serious. Would you, would you see him as any less competent than you already do? I'd see him as more confident. <laughs> really? like, hey, wow. a man who poops no, his pants and just goes, yeah, so I'm what? Not, I'm, I'm not trying to poop my pants. Yeah, I guess, I guess, I guess, I guess my point is people talk about this in, in it's, uh, you know, it's, it's gross, but the point is people are so ready to believe it because whether it happened or not, it's not as if it would undermine his credibility. I'm sorry to say, I mean, he's an old man who can't take care of himself and he's leading the country. He got to go. That's you gotta depressing. Go. Yeah. Yeah. I'm it, not. Even, I'm not even trying to make fun of him. It was wild how there were uh, there were fact checks on that he looked lost at the White House reception, <laughs> wow, really? and Reuters was like, he didn't. He didn't look lost at the White House reception. No, he was just looking for the Secretary of the Interior, which he clearly I lost. I, 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 which he couldn't yeah. find her. All right, here you we know, go. We got can't San say that. Sandy Warren says just landed in Nashville this morning. The rain definitely wasn't something I was expecting. <laughs> what sort of cultural content were you guys looking to branch into? As an army guy, I've been craving a non-satire place for military content. Mm. I don't know if that's uh, anything you know we're looking at just yet, but in terms of cultural content and Nashville, uh, we we mentioned with John Rich on the show the other day that we were planning on going to Redneck Riviera, his venue, on Saturday. I think it's going to be Saturday afternoon. I don't know the exact time. So for those that were planning on being there, because I'm super excited, it's going to be fun. We're going to we're going to jam on his stage. He's got a, a downtown Nashville. Uh, show up in the early morning and stay there all day, and then we'll figure out when we get there. I think it's going to be in the afternoon, so it's going to be super fun. But Nashville's cool, man. Being wanted from, to clarify being, that. Being from being from Dallas, I got to say this to all the Nashvilleites. I don't know what they're called, Nashvilleonians, whatever you guys are. <laughs> Nashvilleonians. <laughs> I, 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 I think I, that's a pastry. I went, I, well, I went out on a, on a Monday night. I mean, I didn't drink or anything because yeah, like right. I, I wasn't planning on going out and doing anything crazy. I, that's popping more than any area in Dallas on a Monday night. Like I walked out and yeah. like, it was like party central. I was like, I oh did. My I gosh. went out also Monday night, but I was drinking and I had a great time. I would have went and grabbed a beer. Oh. I just didn't yeah, know yeah, that was like, I didn't yeah. know Mondays were cool in Nashville. I think it's yeah, like yeah, every, yeah, it's cool. I think every night is in basically. In Deep Ellum, someone just gets shot. That's our right. equivalent. Yeah. <laughs> For real. All right, I right. like Deep Ellum. <laughs> yeah. All right. Funny Farm says, Matt, you surely inspired many. As the country's premier LGBT author, do you have any tips for someone who wants to contribute to the market of children's books? Keep it up. You're my spirit animal. <laughs> well, um, the Daily Wire is getting, it's so our big announcement. We're getting into children's content. So um, get in touch with us, I guess. Would you book. be interested in a Chicken City children's show? Oh. I think it sounds great. I don't think you need to change it to make it a children's show. Just yeah. my kids would, would watch that. They would just oh, watch yeah. Like the chicken parties. Yeah. Like I hear from parents, they're like, their kids are like, I want to see the chicken party. And then they'll donate. And then the chicken party happens. And the chickens just go nuts. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I, it's, it's probably the, you know, Chicken City might save this world. It's mm -hmm. going to unite everybody. I think no that's one, it. no one can deny the chickens are hilarious yep. and heartwarming. They well, are hilarious and heartwarming. You know what? It's can ridiculous. I, um, 
can I before we do another super chat? I just want to shout Ian out because this was this is a very packed full house tonight, and he had to. Uh, he and I had a conversation about who's going to do the show tonight. He very gracefully agreed to let me do it so we could have a panel of papists. He's very gracious. Uh, <laughs> and so he'll be he'll be back, but just wanted to thank him. Shane was just like, come on, out. man, there's so many Catholics. I was like, come on, good. we got to take it uh, over, man. You, you know there's a lot of Catholics here because like, the first thing we talk about is the principle of double effect. And <laughs> yeah, like, exactly. so, what is uh, that? Yeah. <laughs> All right, so we got a bunch of super chats from back during the conversation about abortion. Sandy Warren says, "Do ectopic pregnancies and placenta previa count as abortion?" No. I, yeah, no. I, I know that I can't. I can only speak to ectopic pregnancies. I know that even WebMD and Planned Parenthood have said they're not classified as abortions. So really, yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. interesting. Well, it's not an abortion if it's not in the womb. Mm. Mm. All right, here we go. What, what is this? It's like Kleinfeld is not transgenderism. It's the same thing. Right. Like when you're talking about actual genetic and problems that are going on in the body, it's just a whole other category. Exactly. But they want they want to select that one edge case in order to justify everything else. That and the, and the, do. double, yeah. the double effect principle applies to the ectopic pre pregnancy yes. too. Yeah. Yeah. It's going yeah. to the triple effect. All right. Josh Karen says, Elijah being on the show made me double check what show I was watching. Where is yes. Sydney? <laughs> uh, she is back in Dallas. But I'm here live and I'm traveling, so I don't know. Yeah, we were like, dude, come on our show. Your show's dumb. Yeah, yeah he's, he's like, like, you're right. My show. He's like, he's like, get the hell out of Dallas. And I'm like, I don't want to get shot in Deep Elm. I want to go <laughs> drink a beer in Nashville. Well, we, you know, actually, Elijah didn't want to come on the show, but we fired up our transportation device, which That's ricocheted it. off the satellite, just beamed him here. And <laughs> I he was literally, like, I was no like walking choice. to the stage and I showed up and I'm like, dude, oh my gosh, it's my favorite LGBT author. Well, and so I, I, like, I also, wow. I, I really want to reaffirm that what that raid did is it, it vaporized him and then duplicated him <laughs> elsewhere because that's how transporters work. So the original Elijah is no more. I already died. The minute I had to go into the Amazed dot com child teaching kids about sex site my dad you're like you know what you died. can teleport me <laughs> yeah. yeah that's fine i was like kill the rest of me all right he's Draconius. on that planet with Riker. Draconia says i find yeah <laughs> Draconia says oh star trek reference always work for me yeah. I, Draconia says i find it really interesting that the new york subway incident happened the very next day after biden announced the radical gun control agenda the government wouldn't create a crisis to push legislation right uh, well, I actually think it's more more so just the media wouldn't over cover certain stories and go nuts with them to pursue some kind of political agenda. You know, when when Ukraine happens, all of a sudden every media outlet is like, come on, stand with Ukraine. And I'm like, you know, we don't see this for every other war the U.S. is engaged in or every, every other conflict. You don't got people walking around with Saudi Arabia or Yemen flags talking about conflict over there, weapons sales. You don't see it with Afghanistan or Iraq. So when the media latches on and pushes the narrative, that's the question I have. Not whether or not people stage stuff. I mean, they do, but it's also the media just being like, oh, look at that thing. All right. Joshua Sheldon says, Matt, as to the new skirmish you're starting with libertarians, should there be a limit to using the law to cover all of morality? Should drunken hookup culture be outlawed? Mm. Well, you have to be more specific about outlawing drunken hookup culture. I mean, I, I would be... It, I, I would entertain some laws that might curtail it some, but uh, that's kind of that's kind of a broad question. I, I think though, look, with with the legislating morality, but um, what we have to understand is that every law legislates morality because every law is based in some sense of what is good and what is bad. Because if if you weren't legislating morality, as they say, then you'd be making laws what arbitrarily you'd be making laws with no with no idea of what if it's if it's good or bad. Maybe that's what's actually happening. <laughs> yeah, but that, that is now we do have laws that are legislating morality wrongly or with or, or according to the wrong moral code. But uh, at the end of the day, it does come down to whether it's good or bad. So it's kind of like everything that's illegal. Nothing should be illegal unless it's bad. But well, that, that doesn't mean that every bad thing should be illegal. So there used to be laws against hookup culture, basically. There used to be this law. Um, there used to be a crime of seduction that I think is still on the books in Mississippi, really? perhaps. Yeah, so the crime of seduction would be if you were um, if you were a young woman who slept with a man who had promised to marry you, and you slept with him under the pretenses that he was going to marry you, and then he didn't marry you, you could he could be charged with the crime of seduction. Oh, wow. Hmm. Yeah. That's, that's, that's crazy. Simple, RVs yeah. being mad about us fighting against hookup culture. Every RV needs hookups, so... All right. That's my dad we joke some, of the uh, day. That's my dad joke of the day. Black Czar says the failing of the drunk driver to pregnancy analogy is that it presumes it is by state design a system exists whereby one must provide vital aid to another. But in reality, the system predates society. The umbilical cord is not a social contract. What comes after is. Interesting. All right. Billy Two Cent says just a question. Wouldn't a woman getting an abortion be the equivalent of hiring a hitman? In that case, why not punish the woman? You wouldn't just punish the hitman in a similar situation. 
What if, and just to elaborate uh, or, or to expand upon this, often the, the assassins are government agents undercover to arrest the woman who wants to say kill her husband or the husband and his wife. What if you eventually end up with G-man abortion doctors and the women go in and then he's like, pulls out his badge, like, I gotcha. You're under arrest. Well, even the law in Oklahoma doesn't punish the woman. It punishes the doctor. Right. Well, I think it's I'm just saying hypothetically mm -hmm. under this premise. Yeah, you get into this question about should you punish the woman. I mean, I think it's just like any other, just like with our murder laws that govern the murder of born people. It's, it's, it's you, you look at the, at the circumstances. It's not like you have one penalty in place for murder. There's different degrees of murder and so on. So I think if abortion is characterized legally as murder, which it should be, it's going to be sort of like the, the, the same sort of thing, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I would agree with that. There certainly have been uh, places where the woman was criminalized for, um, held criminally liable for abortion or attempted abortion. Yeah, and there have also been instances where people have been charged with uh, killing an unborn child when it wasn't there. So, for example, a man, uh, someone can be wasn't charged with like double Scott homicide. Thing? Yeah, so like someone can be charged with double homicide if they kill someone who's pregnant. Case? Wasn't I'm not this familiar. guy and he like... He killed his wife and uh, her unborn baby, and yeah. then he was charged blamed twice. a black guy. And oh, wow. It was in Boston. Am I getting everything screwed up? Yeah, I, I think, think it was in I Boston. Oh. Scott Peterson? Is that what you're talking about? Oh, there was Peterson, too. Yeah. 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 There okay, was, yeah, I don't yeah, know. I know what you're Peterson. talking about. Scott Peterson, yeah. Here's, here's, I well, don't know who Scott Lacey is. I have no idea. That Lacey Peterson, you mean? <laughs> Lacey Peterson. There you go. There, now it's okay. all working. Walsh, we'll start throwing names out. <laughs> Just throw it all out there. Like, I was just going to say, I mean, if, if abortion is illegal, then everybody involved should be cr criminally liable for it. I absolutely believe that. But that doesn't mean um, what, what is the penalty and all that. Then you have to look at the, at the individual circumstances, just like you do with any other murder. Yeah, it, I was because I was asked this. Well, I just want to clarify. I was asked this question on the last show, and my thinking at the time was basically, well, um, a lot of these women don't know what they're doing, etc. I think they're lied to by the abortion industry. And I still argue that we should take those things into account. But again, if we believe that it's murder, then it becomes a question of what kind of punishment uh, and not necessarily a question of is there punishment at all. Right. Michael Tierney says, Tim, once they allow abortions for rape victims, false rape accusations will skyrocket and innocent men will be in prison. Mm. Perhaps. What do you guys think? Will women make up rape stories just to be able to get an abortion? And put hmm. kill a baby and then put a guy in prison. I mean, that sounds a bit extreme, right? Well, that is one of the many problems with the rape exception is that it's just how do you even enforce it in the first place? So you you, you know, I think you shouldn't have the exception because the baby it's it's wrong to kill the baby. But also, you put that exception in place, then right, it is hard to how do you, how do you differentiate? How do you enforce that? Do you consider yourself pro-choice, Libby? You know, I continue to be uh, have questions about this issue. I definitely am not in favor of abortion. I don't think anyone should have an abortion. Um, I think it's exactly the wrong thing to do and I don't think anyone should do it. I do have questions about, um, you know, situations of rape and incest. I do have questions about that. Um, yeah, so I think, I think that the way to pursue it is to encourage a value system that values parenthood, that values mothers, that values life. I bring this up because we have a good, a good one. Vincent Young says, you can't have the government decide abortion. Humanity has to want life. It's mm -hmm. the only way to change consciousness. And you mentioned... I agree with that. I, I think you were that mentioning... That applies to infanticide, though. What, well, that what, argument. Well, the government can't ban abortion. People just have to not want to well, do it because it, they should want life to exist. It's, it's not saying they, sh they, 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 they shouldn't. It's saying to solve the problem. Oh, okay. And I think you brought up earlier there's a cultural issue. I do think that's right. Yeah. There's actually um, an anti-abortion advocate in Texas... Um, Destiny, Destiny Hernandez. Do I have her name right? I don't remember exactly, but she, her, her, her organization works to encourage motherhood, right? She's yeah. not trying to change policy. She's trying to change women's minds. Brian Prius says, if an unborn person's value is dependent upon the condition of conception, is it wrong to kill the same person post birth if conceived by rape? Mm -hmm. If so, why the difference? A person is always a person deserving of a chance of life. I completely agree with that. I was always confused by a conservative argument that there's an exception for rape and incest in terms of killing the baby. Right. Now, you know, the, the argument or the discussion I'd say we, we had was making a person carry the baby that they didn't choose to. But I think we, you know, there's that uh, the ultimate conclusion was uh, a woman won't die from having the baby, but the baby will die from the abortion. And that's why I was making the point about with with born children we have no problem saying to the parent no matter how the child was conceived like you have a responsibility to that child and so i think i, I don't i don't see why we can't apply the same principle 
All right, so we we got a bunch of these ones, and there were some directed at you. Uh, Kyle Bruvs, uh, Brusveen says, Tim Pool, quote, can't kill anyone on death row in case they are not guilty. <laughs> also, Tim Pool, in cases of rape, kill the innocent child slash victim. Mm -hmm. Tim, you are almost there. Mm -hmm. No, I've repeatedly said I think abortion is wrong. I think there's a challenge in answering ethical questions around what the government has the right to enforce in certain circumstances as it pertains to individuals' life, li liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, while fully acknowledging every time that life begins at conception. I just think that there is ethical challenges. But but I, th I think if there's any issue with no middle ground, it is absolutely abortion. It, it is it is a, a, a spire, and you're on one side or the other. There's no, there's no teetering in the middle of that one. I don't know if you wanted to elaborate. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm thoroughly opposed to abortion. <laughs> I'm thoroughly opposed to capital punishment as well. I don't think yeah, the I, government should be um, killing prisoners either. I, th I think the issue is the left has turned what was supposed to amount to safe, legal, and rare as a begrudging compromise. Yes. They turned it into, you get an abortion, and you get that, an abortion. You know, that's sort of the real issue for me. Um, it was so interesting. Like, I, I was raised Catholic by my dad's second wife, uh, mm. and I went to Catholic school, and we saw... Uh, videos of abortion when I was in eighth grade um, and I was I've been entirely opposed to abortion ever since then and my mom thought it was horrifying when I eventually moved in with her that I was so opposed to abortion um, and so I've had decades of debate with my mom on this issue Mm -hmm. I, I got to give a shout out well, to the 800 people who said adoption in the super chats. Yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. A lot of people have mentioned adoption. I agree. I definitely do. My, yeah, my family wouldn't exist without adoption. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I disagree with the idea of uh, abortion as contraception. I think it used to be in this country that was the case. Mm -hmm. But now the left, modern left, is just like, why not? Well, the, anyway? the other issue, too, that we have is that there's this idea that you shouldn't be ashamed of having an abortion, that you shouldn't feel bad about it. And that also, I think, is an issue that you're supposed to be like, yay, I had an abortion. You know, I saw a cake today and it was like, uh, it's an abortion instead of it's yeah. a boy. Um, it was like, so you sad. know, some. That's also viral massive that's thing. And that's a huge issue for me as well, that like this is something that, you know, people, Hollywood celebrities get up and accept awards saying I couldn't have done this if I didn't kill my baby. It's like that's a horrifying, horrifying. It is horrifying. We also situation. we also have to understand that's like that's that's massive overcompensation on their part. You mm. know, that's that's mm. that's them trying to convince themselves by convincing the rest of us that they're happy with, with that they're, they're not and, upset and, about it. And I think it's true because I, 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 I'm pretty sure we were talking about this on the show a few months ago that people who have kids develop a harder drive. Mm. So it's like I don't, I don't understand why, you know, terminating your children makes you better. In fact, most stories I know are people who are like, when they had kids, they became more driven and, and like, I have it to It makes succeed. it so much choice. easier to prioritize what you want to do and what you don't want to do. <laughs> like, after my yeah. son was born and I wanted to spend time, I wanted to, like, properly mother my child, it was so much easier when, like, some random project came up to just be like, nope, I'm not doing that one. You know, just mm. don't care. I'm going to do, I'm going to hang out with my kid instead. All right. We got a ton of super chats on this one debate, oh. but I don't want to just uh, take the whole super chat up by people. Thank you, uh, guys. Yeah, but really, really, you know, great points. I appreciate it. Um, and and I'll, I'll shout, shout out to Brett uh, Tesdall and everybody else who keeps saying, yo, yo guys, mention adoption. Huh, uh, he did. says, I'm, I'm adopt, an adopted did. child, an adoptive parent, and it's infuriating the adoption option is often disregarded. No, I completely agree with adoption, and there's a huge wait list. Parents want to adopt kids, man. For for infant adoption in particular, there's a, a Yeah, how age. about adopt older children? Yeah. You know, definitely. like I think adopting older children is a, is a really yeah. strong, good move. All right, Sanity Clause says the ban for talking about veteran status was specifically created to get rid of Navy of a Navy SEAL who was outing people who lied about serving slash type of service, wow. like being a SEAL, Ranger in combat, etc. Left slanted policy not meant to protect real vets. Interesting. I mean, I remember seeing that and I was like, really, veterans? Hmm. You can't disparage veterans. I mean, you sh you, you shouldn't. You know, you can disparage people for being bad people, I suppose. But yeah. All right. John Castle says, Tim and Co., talking of a movie The Daily Wire could make, look up The Battle of Castle it Itter. I, for one, think it'd make a great movie. Hmm. Interesting. Is there a movie? Uh, is there a Beowulf movie? Yes. Yeah. Really? Is yeah. it good? I haven't seen it. Mm. I don't know. Do you like the story of Beowulf? Yeah. Well, maybe you'll like it. Maybe. But, you know, as they often make movies, they... Or... They're not always... They, they don't always make great movies. No Not To Give says... Matt and Libby hit an, imp an important point. Kids are learning that natural changes are a disease. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. that's creepy to me. It's, mm -hmm. It was just like, you know, you're going to go through puberty. Something's going to happen. Welcome to life. And now we're like, but we can stop it with technology. 
And what is that going to do to people? You know, I reinforce to my son, who's probably going to be a big, tall guy. <laughs> I did tell him, I'm like, you're going to grow up to be a really big, tall guy. And that's great. That's a great thing to be. You got to show him Chicken City. <laughs> oh. oh, he's seen Chicken <laughs> He's because chicken. you see the rooster. <laughs> you know, here's the fascinating thing. And, you know, I'll take every opportunity to mention Chicken City. When we got the chickens, we were told they were all hens. And they all looked the same. And then one day we're like, that one's starting to look a little different. What's going on? Chicken puberty. Now Roberto chicken is puberty. He's oh twice God. as tall as the other hysterical. ones. <laughs> they behave differently. No one. These chickens didn't have parents. They were hatched, put in a box. Orphan chickens. And, yeah. But but they, they developed these characteristics because, you know, sexual dimor dimorphism is a thing. Mm -hmm. And you can you can you, you can see that. Plus, we have we have the babies hatching. Yeah. Very educational show. Good for kids. So you adopted all chicken these chickens. City. Chicken Run, by That's the right. way. Side note was an incredible Great. movie. Oh yeah, and it was actually the first movie. And there was Chicken Run two as well. I didn't see. But it. now we have Chicken Run three, Chicken City, which is uh, the <laughs> next <laughs> the next installment. Can I, can I just say yeah. I I have this experience so often as a parent. I, I tried to because that's actually a kids movie that I can watch and endure. And I tried to show it to my to my kids, and they just they hated it. Oh no! <laughs> oh my gosh! You know what? It, it's sad though, because that's that's another form of animation that's just been lost because everything's CG yeah. now. Claymation. That claymation oh and that God. film is so masterfully animated. Wallace it's and very Gromit. comical too. Yeah. All right. Well done. Firebelly. Yeah, we, we watch Wallace and Gromit at my house. And we like it. Firebelly says, it's "Kid good. has better taste than my yeah. kids." <laughs> Matt, have you considered broadening your academic pursuits into fat studies? Oh, oh. hey, um, this is a smart move. Yeah, yeah. Well, I know Stephen Crowder already had that covered. Yeah, so. yeah. Oh, that's right, yeah. that's right. He did a good job on that. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of, you know, I'm, I'm branching out slowly, but I'm, right now I'm kind of settled <laughs> as a woman study scholar. I saw, I saw a meme, and it was like Matt Walsh, comma, who doesn't know what a woman is, comma. And I thought it was a funny insult because I'm like, yeah. yo, it's you guys who can't answer the question. Yeah, like. You defined it every opportunity you right. had. So their insult is you can't when it's it, it's them. That's the joke. Yeah. That's so it's like, like Socrates, who doesn't know what impiety was like. The point is you <laughs> ask the question right. because you know the answer, but you know they don't. Right. It's all they can do. Yeah. You know, but uh, I mean, it's fascinating. I wonder what parents. I'm really curious to see what happens this uh, this November. I don't think just voting Republican solves anything. I think voting in the primaries and knowing who you're voting for can help solve some things. But I'm wondering how many parents are going to be like, yeah, I'm not going to vote for those people because they can't define what a woman is. I wonder how many suburban housewives are going to be like, I think I know what a woman is. Mm. And when they try to when they try to flip it around on us, it's like, well, you could. I mean, I have a I haven't even mentioned yet. I have a movie coming out called What is a Woman? You go to what is a woman dot com. And um, you, you could easily embarrass me in particular, but a lot of us just by giving a definition just give a definition of the word i've got like a book and a movie coming out you could you could totally negate that and make it really embarrassing by just defining give me give me the definition hey, can i ask would, you, would you accept yeah. um the oxford dictionary yeah but that's that's the de that's the definition they don't want to give like right. i adult human female <laughs> is the definition but if you don't want to go with that definition then what is it and they can't do that it, can it's, i it's go ahead i just want to ask you uh is there anything even close to a coherent definition you got from anyone Absolutely not. Wow, that's but fascinating. You know what? Absolutely not. Th that's but weird. It's such a I apologize thing for interrupting. By the way, yeah. I thought you were done. No, 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 Matt. That is weird because what I also saw was was a uh, total gaslight recently. Was people keep saying, especially conservatives, biological males and biological females, okay, as if a, there is no, but 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 as if there is like when you're in biology, you never say, well, this is a biological. There's male. a that's reason a male that this is, female. but there's a reason that this is said. Well, I know why people say it. People say it because otherwise you're going to get banned on social media. I mean, well, and yes you're going to get yes and, and you're no. going to come up against Canadian I'm just, hate speech. I'm just saying we've had to add this an African American and a hyphen like a yeah, biological I, I male. Agree, I agree. I agree with. I agree with that, that. That's better not to say biological male because it does seem to insinuate or imply rather that, Other that there's another males. type. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I think when I say, I agree I, as well. When I when I say it, I say it more, and I'm trying not to say it anymore. But for me, it was always like a point of emphasis. It's like saying I used to say it too. It's like it's like saying I'm I'm standing on solid ground. It's like well, of course the ground is solid. It's just right. emphasizing that the ground is Liquid solid. Ground. So, right, biological male just but emphasizes the biological. What if, what if you said something like Leah Thomas is the first male to win the women's NCAA swim? You know. You get banned on Twitter, and you're. No, I, I tweeted. And that. You're, I tweeted. Yeah, that. did you get banned? No, I didn't. No, it it's a scientific out? word. Okay. Right. Well, and maybe it's going to start switching back. Maybe we're going to start being able to say the truth I, I, online I, again. Now I, that I Elon think, Musk has those shares, right? Uh, the, That's, the, 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 who knows? The, there's there's several issues. One is elitism. How powerful are you on their platform? And they try to avoid big splash bans and suspensions. So I've got a million Twitter followers. Oh, I, yeah, I definitely They'll, don't. So. Right. Exactly. <laughs> so there's there's a privilege in that because right. Twitter's like this would be bad for the platform. 
and it would also create a big wave of news, which we don't want. So we'll, you know, we'll give passes to certain people. But also, I look at their rules very carefully, and I know what I tweet doesn't break the rules, and the left flips out. They're like, Tim Pool is transphobic. I'm like, I disparage nobody. I, I, you, don't you agree yeah, truth, that, that Leah Thomas is, is biologically the... male? I'm not disparaging Leah Thomas. In fact, I actually argued uh, 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 that the women weren't speaking up and that if the rules were set and no parent complained and no swimmer complained, why should I be mad about something they're not complaining about? I did find it incredibly frustrating that no one, uh, that so few people were willing to put their face and name to their complaints. You had parents speaking anonymously, swimmers speaking anonymously. We, it was we, infuriating. We just talked to Jonathan Isaac. Mm -hmm. He's the NBA player who refused to kneel for Black Lives Matter during the, this, the, the anthem. And they got mad at him. They were like, hey, everyone's doing this. And he was like, it's not what I believe. And he's like, I'm not mad at you for kneeling. I just, this is what I believe. And I was like, you know, it was so refreshing to hear his story. We interviewed him for a, for a special we're doing. And I was just like, that's amazing, dude. And it's like, this is what you feel. It's what you believe. Like, I don't care if Colin Kaepernick wants to kneel or whatever, but he brought politics into the game. He brought politics into the game. And I can understand people being like, we don't want it here. Now that they've made everything about politics, there's a guy who's saying, like, I don't want to kneel. And I'm like, you shouldn't have to. If, right. you, if you want to politicize the game and make it politics, the one guy who just stands like, a nor like they normally do is now being told he's making it political. I'm like, he's the guy who's not making it political. Everyone else is. All right, let's just do, uh, we'll do a couple more Super Chats here. Box Fed TV says, Matt, I live in Hollywood. My writer friends have scripts. How can they get them to you guys they want out of Hollywood? To the Daily Wire? Yeah. I don't even know if I'm illegally allowed to answer that. Well, just get in touch with, uh, go to dailywire.com and yep. go, go through that. I don't know. People, people should understand um, there are challenges to sending unsolicited materials anywhere. If you ever watch, yeah. you guys ever see, you ever see Airheads? He, uh, Brendan Fraser's character sneaks into the record label and he's like, check out my CD. And he's like, that is not solicited. I cannot look at it. Right. Because it, what happens is someone sends an email, an employee looks at it, now the company can never go anywhere near anything related to that content because they'll get accused of stealing it. Plus, so they're why just not, like, nope, like, nope. Don't send it to me, I guess is the answer. Go to dailywire.com. And, and maybe make your own movie. Like, get some funding. Make your own stuff. Yeah. Make more content. Yeah, how to get out you of Hollywood? You don't need permission. Like, just just get your truck and move and make your movie somewhere. G, uh, Goff says, so fun to see Matt talk about aliens. It is a happy day for Matt, <laughs> even though it doesn't show. Yeah, I, I was really glad that we were able to get into that. That's that's my. <laughs> do you? Like, I'm, I'm I'm totally outnumbered at the Daily Wire. By the way, we've had this conversation <laughs> on the backstage sad. shows, and I'm just like, it's me against the world there on the alien topic. <laughs> they just they don't believe it. You or left they don't the talk wrong about company because I feel like I'm the one outnumbered. Where I'm like not big into extraterrestrial, and everyone's like, I just sit there and I'm like, I'm not even gonna try to make a case because I'm sitting with like five. Pe it's always I'm sitting around five people that are like big on You're the wrong. extraterrestrial. So I'm just like, all right, whatever. <laughs> Yeah, it is. And it's tough, too, because I'm having this debate, and then, like, Ben Shapiro's on the other side, and i got to debate him. About, he's he's got, like, okay, folks, actually, aliens are ridiculous, he's, okay? He's got all the facts about, <laughs> yeah, you know, the universe so and stuff. And it's like, <laughs> yep. Oh. All right, everybody. I, I doubt that he has all the facts about the universe. He has literally has all the facts. All Michael, the Michael facts. Knowles okay. burns you on I'm a so ukulele. <laughs> all right. If you have not already, smash that like button, subscribe to this channel, share the show with your friends. And go to TimCast.com, become a member. We're going to have that special extra spicy members only segment coming up at 11 p.m. Eastern. So it'll be up soon. And as a member, you'll support all of our journalists and help keep all of this uh, this rolling. So we really do appreciate it. You can follow the show at TimCast IRL. You can follow me at TimCast basically everywhere. Matt, do you want to shout anything out? Yes. Uh, what is a woman dot com? I have my documentary coming out in in May. I can't say a lot about it, but we'll have uh, be revealing very soon some more. It's a, it'll be. A lot of people are going to be very angry when they see it. That's all I can All right. Oh, yeah. All right on. <laughs> Elijah, what's up? Uh, a little more quiet today, a little more pensive. Listen, listen to the wise people speak as always. And if you want to hear a podcast that it's not the wisest person in the world, <laughs> but is a hell of a lot of fun, check out Slightly Offensive on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, anywhere you can find them. And also, I was thinking with Chicken City. I was, I was like, dude, is there some sort of a goal? Like, if we reach a certain amount of donation number, we get to see a chicken race, and we get to see who's the real dominant. Or is there, is there any type of goals that we're reaching? There, there is. I want to give. Yeah, yeah. So, so Chicken Party is the first. For every hundred dollars that's that's donated through super chats or you know given to feed the chickens, a chicken party happens. The next thing we're thinking is after ten chicken parties in one day, Ian goes out and plays music for the chickens. <laughs> oh, Something yeah. like that. But that requires Amazing. Ian Freaking to come out. Ian. You know, he'll, 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 oh, it'll have to be like guy. before seven p.m. or something. So you know, give him some crystals or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hell yeah. Okay, it's my turn. <laughs> yeah, it's your turn. Uh, I'm Libby Emmons, and uh, you could help me get to a million followers on Twitter at Libby Emmons. 
And I'm at thepostmillennial.com every day. If you want to help us out, we're thepostmillennial.com slash contribute. Also, I'm going to be at uh, the Better Discourse event in Fort Worth. Mm. Not this coming weekend because that's Easter, but the following weekend. If you want to come check that out, it's betterdiscourseevent.com. I'm Seamus Coughlin. We just uploaded a cartoon on Freedom Tunes today. I honestly think it's one of the funniest <laughs> videos good. we've done in a while. I really want you guys to go check that out. I think you'll love it. Just go to Freedom Tunes. Check it out. It's called Biden's Fallen and He Can't Get Up. And I'll, uh, I'll turn it over to you guys. Right, yeah, I'm also here in the corner. I finally figured out how to press my buttons once again with this new camera setup. You guys may follow me on Twitter at Sarah Patchlids, also on Minds.com and SarahPatchlids.me. We will see all of you over at TimCast.com. Thanks for hanging out. Bye, guys.